Wells in Town Hall tonight, folks. Fun with our star comedian, Fred Allen. It's Town Hall tonight! <laughs> As Fred Allen leads the parade to the old town hall. Fred's conducting the band with a big sword, followed by those dull blades of the board for Marty Allen, our players. Let's join the shouting song. Everybody's going. Everybody. Here they come, elopers. Hurry up, darling. You haven't even packed your things. All I'm taking is you and my radio, sweetheart. It's town hall tonight. Detective. Yes, officer. The thief took $15,000 at my jewelry. It could be worse, lady. Suppose he took your radio. It's town hall tonight. Fortune teller. Tell me the truth, Swami. Is my husband out with another woman? Do not worry. Swami's crystal show husband home by radio, madam. It's town hall tonight. <laughs> Well, sir, here we are before the old town hall, and there's Fred exchanging iambic banter with the crowd. Let's listen. This year's kisses may not taste as sweet, folks, but we didn't come to neck. We're here to open up the old town hall. Step lively, please. Hi, fancy stockings. Hello there, Buster. Evening, Tuttlemouth. Hi there, Sister Nag. Step right in. You laugh, you weep, you'll fall asleep on the inside. So hurry, hurry. hurry. Presenting that Goliath, that gargantuan, that great big giant of just jubilant, jive, joko, jamboree, jovial. The Jubilee Pan Jambrum, Fred Jallet, and Jason. <laughs> Thank you. That was quite a Norwegian introduction, Harry. I drove down in my pajores and uh, arrived at the, the studio here. Good evening, ladies. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, before the man from the Social Security office gets here to see about enrolling the joke, I'll read you the town hall bulletin for tonight. Hard twice, the first grocer to get into trouble with the SPCA for breaking the tusks off elephants in his animal crackers, has a special announcement. Hard says you customers have got to quit scratching matches on the cigar counter. The cigar case has just been varnished. And Hodge says, men, if the seats of your pants are so thin, you're afraid a match will raise a divot, <laughs> just say the word when you want to light up, and Hodge will bend over and oblige. <laughs> so much for friction around the county seat. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> now for the... <laughs> Now for the town hall news. The curtain, Harry. All route down, Fred. The, uh, the lights go out, and we bring you the latest news of the week. The town hall news sees nothing, shows all. Hollywood, California. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences makes its annual award for best performances of the year. Town hall news following an Academy's footsteps presents its annual awards to outstanding underdogs of the film industry. Tonight we pay tribute to little patrons who did big things in movie theaters during 1936. A town hall award goes to Mr. Caswell Slink. Mr. Slink. Ah, public! Mr. Slink, you were the first man to refuse to go into a moving picture theater because there was a picket outside. Right. As soon as I seen that guy picket an ice cream. Were you in sympathy with the cause? I didn't wait to read no signs, buddy. Why did you run? Two months ago, that picket stole my wife. So? So maybe he wants to give her back. I ain't taking no chances. A town hall award? A town <laughs> After the pickets are out in force this evening. <laughs> a town hall award goes to Mrs. Daphne Squat, champion seat saver in movie theaters for 1936. <laughs> Mrs. Squat. Yes, I saved 269 seats for friends last year. You have some sort of a system for seat saving, Mrs. Squat? Oh, yes. As soon as I see an empty seat, I light a candle and put it underneath. Mm -hmm. If anybody sits down, they see the seats warm. When they look around, I say, the party's coming right back. What do, you, uh, what do you do if somebody sits down next to you and refuses to get up? I just lean over and say, I hope you won't mind my double pneumonia. A town, a town, a town hall award goes to Strong Arm Murphy, the first man to break one of those little bombs in a movie theater and have, and have nothing happen. 
Strong Arm Murphy. No cracks, folks. You uh, broke a bomb in one theater, Strong Arm? Yeah, I fell it in the aisles and mashed it into the carpet. Wasn't there any odor? It was brutal. <laughs> and uh, nothing happened in the theater? No, nah, the audience thought it was a picture. <laughs> Town Hall Award goes to Mr. Manuel Fring, the most unusual organist to appear in a movie theater during 1936. Mr. Fring. Uh, thank you, my friend. Why are you the most unusual organist for 1936, Mr. Fring? I played the organ all year with my feet. How so? Well, in all movie theaters, the organ comes up on a hydraulic platform. They put on the brake and the organ stops. I see. Then the organist comes up on a hydraulic stool. He's supposed to stop even with the organ. Why did you, why couldn't you play with your hands? All here, the stool is stopping four feet higher than the organ, so what can I do? I play with my toes. <laughs> the Town Hall Award goes to Mrs. Hilda Wonk, the luckiest woman movie goer for 1936. Mrs. Wonk. Oh, I'm lucky, all right, folks. How lucky are you, Mrs. Wonk? Well, I left my gum under my seat one week and came back the next week. And the gum was still there? You said a mouthful, mister. <laughs> The Town Hall Award goes to Mr. Daphne Bleach. Mr. Bleach. Boo, 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 Just a minute, Mr. Bleach. You are the loudest singer in the movie theater audience there. Well, I ain't here to brag, bud. Boo, 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 boo. Uh, now, what is the uh, the loudest you have ever sung, Mr. Bleach? Well, uh, last week at the Paramount, they let down the song sheet. The song was Moonlight and Roses. Well, sir, 4,000 people started singing the lead. I give them four bars head start, and then I started my baritone. Uh, how did you come out, Mr. Blee? On uh, 43rd Street. <laughs> 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 uh, Town Hall Award goes to Mr. Malcolm Trent. Mr. Trent. I can take it, brother. You made the outstanding remark in a movie theater for 1936. Yeah, we sing all night. The guy on the stage was calling out the numbers, and finally a lady shouted, Bingo! And that is when you made your outstanding remark. Right, I said, oh, heck. Uh, what, did the, what did the rest of the audience say? Oh! Thank you, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Hollywood, California. As March 15th approaches, movie stars prepare to pay income taxes on fabulous salaries. Town Hall News presents candid camera shot of a well-known film star filling out form. Uh, guess what? Yes, madam? Bring me a double pot of house steak, mother and lamp down, plenty of mashed potatoes and some custard fries. Is uh, madam celebrating? It's getting near March the feast, guess what? i got to fill out the form. <laughs> Winter, Wisconsin. Arvid Twist, 20-year-old farm youth, eats 36 flapjacks in 61 minutes, to win National Flapjack Eating Championship. Town Hall News interviews new Flapjack champion to get message for youth of America, Mr. Twist. Hello, folks. Well, Mr. Twist, how does it feel to be the Flapjack champion of America? Well, I'm too full for words. <laughs> you can take that two ways. <laughs> uh, fine, are you? Uh... <laughs> are you uh, satisfied with your record? Oh, uh, shucks. I could have beat it. What happened? Some smart aleck put glue in the maple syrup. And my tongue stuck to my upper plate. Did you have any bad effects after eating 36 flapjacks? Well, no. I, I just kept turning over all night in my sleep. New York City, New York. Madison Square Garden is jammed to the rafters. The 62nd International Six-Day Bicycle Race comes to a close. Winners this year are popular Belgian riders, Jean Ertz and Omer de Breiker. Town Hall News brings you the sensational finish of this classic event. The winner of the six-day race crosses the line. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. And now for the mighty Allen sacrifice. To prove that the college professor who said people can transmit their thoughts to each other was right, I lay what passes for my mind on the altar of science. I shall allow a young man who never took a lesson in his life to look me firmly between the eyes and read my mind. You ready, Mr. Von Zell? Ready, Mr. Allen. Uh, concentrate, please. Let me see. It always takes a moment or two to clear away the dead timber. <laughs> oh, yes, now I have it. You were thinking that if you had next week's show written, you could skip away for the weekend and relax. By Gad, Bonzel, it's uncanny. I did have that truant thought, 
Your skill savers of decromancy. Oh, it was nothing, Fred. You could do it yourself. Well, not with everybody, Harry, but I think I could tell you what you're thinking about. All right, try it and see. Oh, I know you, Harry. You're thinking about a red and yellow stripe, too. Hypanna toothpaste is on your mind, isn't it? Right, Fred. Peter Van Steven and the Itana Troubadours have just played I've Got Rhythm. Now, on Friday night, there's going... Oh, God. Now, quiet here. Whoever is raising that hub and bub, one thing at a time, if you'll be so kindly. Hello. (laughs) Well, sir, they laughed when I started to stand up in the nightclub. I didn't know I was under a table. <laughs> if it is in Portland. Yes, Papa sent me out to mail a letter to the patent office. What's the trouble? The patent expire and Papa's patent leather shoes? No, Papa's got a new invention. It's a lump of sugar that floats. Oh, I heard about that. It's for people who can't remember whether they put sugar in their coffee or not. <laughs> he lumps Bob up and reminds her. Yes. And Papa's got another invention. It's a rubber coat collar for blue serge suit. What is that? A blue serge suit with a rubber collar. Well, if Sandra falls on your coat collar, it bounces right back up in your hair. <laughs> Papa's full of ideas, among other things, all right, isn't he? Yes, he invented oversized false teeth for the man who has no sense for humor. I get it. If the teeth are too big, the man can't close his mouth. Yes. Huh? That's the idea. He looks as though he's laughing at everything. Has anyone tried out the cheese? I'll say. Papa made a set for himself and they got him into trouble. How? He was laughing when he paid his income tax. So they rushed him away for observation. Well, that's nice. Now, as soon as they get you, you can hold a family reunion. Oh, you'll find out. I will, Mr. Don't bring those Mr. kids. Coming, Fido. Coming, go, sir. Louis, Louis, please. The senior member of the firm is always picking points. So who am I, a silent partner? Silence, sir. Silence. Lucky I was born two years sooner. At least for two years I could say something. Say something? Yeah. Yeah. Now, what do you mean? Wait a minute. If you don't take this portable argument off the premises, gentlemen, yeah. I'm apt to break your legs to match your English. <laughs> Sir, hit me already. I'll sue. And the case will be handled by Lombard Fink, freelance attorney, who I happen to be. Look, look, I say, sir. Before I'm getting hit, he's taking the case already. If you just wait a minute, fellas. Yes, if you guys will keep quiet for just two seconds, you can hear each other fall. Uh-huh. You think my partner is right? Go on, Louis. Hit him. Hit me? Why, I'll pull his nose down so far. If he ever sneezes, he'll vacuum the cuffs on his pants. <laughs> Go on. Go on. Hit me. I'll dare you to hit me. Look, a timid boy. So you give him a smash, Louis. Feel his back, then we'll sue. So who's retaining you already? Look, 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 look. His own brother. He wouldn't give a case. Then your Webster, I should be, maybe, huh? Anybody else but you, you should be. <laughs> The law business is bad. Why don't you sue each other, Mr. Fink? Yes, sue, Bums. <laughs> Bums, he said. You know who you're calling Bums, brother? No, who are you? Tell him, Louis. Are your hands clean, brother? Of course my hands are clean. Okay, here's our card. <laughs> you, are, you are reading it from right to left. Fink, O'Reilly, and Fink, attorneys at law. Take back the card, Louis. Get us gone, Ev. Is that the name of your firm? Things are rally and things. Limited. Trivial cases of specialty. Offer cars at your convenience. What is O'Reilly doing in between you two things? Uh, uh, confidentially, O'Reilly, we are using strictly for bait. <laughs> you mean there's no O'Reilly in the firm? Of course not. And is he lucky? With two things, O'Reilly would starve to death. Have you settled any big cases, Mr. Fink? Uh, you are recalling a case, maybe, Russo versus the Holland Tunnel. Who did you represent, the Holland Tunnel? Fink and Fink were retained by Russo. So-called a plaintiff. What was the case about, Mr. Fink? Russo, a nobody, is living in Jersey. 
And then the Holland Tunnel is opening. A draft is going continually from New York to the tunnel. <laughs> Into the point of cows. Exactly. <laughs> For two years, Russo is suffering pneumonia, so he is retaining pink campaign, and we are taking the case to court. <laughs> Did you give the Holland Tunnel a summons, Mr. Faith? And how? First, we are slapping on a Sabina. Then we are slapping on a Mandamus. <laughs> and at this point, I am requesting a habeas corpus, and the case is going to a higher court. <laughs> What your firm needs is a baritone, boy. <laughs> How did the case come out, Mr. Fay? Our client, Russo, still a nobody, is winning the suit. You mean they closed the Holland Tunnel? No. Russo is winning the suit. Needed underwear. It was Joyce Justice. <laughs> boy, that's some victory. The thing can think it's always a victory. Oh, he's getting monotonous. <laughs> Now, don't tell me you Blackstone buzzards win every case. You are hearing in legal circles regarding Peabody versus Bullworth? No, no, and I'm not interested. Irred Godwin! <laughs> I am opening this case by sneezing. While the judge is saying his own heart, I am appealing. <laughs> what did your client get? A lucky break. The judge was cross-eyed. The foreman of the jury got ten years. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Strategy, strategy for living. Well, this is all very enlightening, boys, but I don't need a lawyer. That's, that's what you think. You've got a case, buddy. It's worth a million dollars. Same to mind, and we are three at fun down in night court. So we who? Jack Benny. <laughs> Jack Benny, wait a minute. Now, why should I sue Jack Benny? For libel, friend, uh, defamation of character. For injury, forgery, usury, injury, and lethargy. <laughs> Have you been listening to the radio, Mr. Faye? Yeah, that's maybe. The complaint is made out already. Listen, on January 3rd, he is calling you a low brow. January 10th, he is calling you a high brow. January 17th, he is saying you're a mini. And without a letter, he is insisting you can't play the police. If we are taking the case, then it will positively settle out of court and not for chicken food. <laughs> Why have you got a case? I will open up with a wrist of the plan. Then I come with a wrist of no crow. Before Benny can move, I am on top of him with a wrist of pencil shooter. You're <laughs> certainly putting on the wrist, Mr. Faith. <laughs> a low life like that should pay with continuity. You couldn't lose, brother. Now, the only thing is, you boys are a little mixed up there with the evidence. Those are the things I call Jack Benny. Uh, I give on. Did you hear that one, Bob? I heard. You made a mistake, Mr. Fink. It could happen to a dog. It has. <laughs> you mean... <laughs> you mean that you are calling this to Jack Benny? Yes, so what? So what is that? Has Benny got a case? This will cost you plenty, Mrs. Well, what are we waiting for, one, Bob? Let's go. Okay. Benny is stopping on the power. It's this way. <laughs> I'll see you later, Portland. Sally, hello. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the mighty Allen Art Players bring you the answer to the theater's eternal question. Which came first, the egg or the actor? Tonight... Tonight, they present a nautical mystery called Murder on the High Sea, or One Long Pan Help Boy Meet Girl. Over to you, Peter. All hands on deck. Hey, the jib boom, the port bow. Hey, hey. Port bow, the jib boom. Hey, hey. What time is that, mate? I fell, sir. Have the men heave anchor. Aye, 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 sir. Come into my cabin, mate. Aye, right, sir. What's the matter with your other eye? I got something in it, sir. <laughs> well, step into my cabin. Draw, right, sir. <laughs> well, we're anchored here at quarantine. I'll check up. Everything's in order, sir. These passengers are finishing a six month cruise. Is everybody satisfied? Only one complaint, Captain. Yes? A lady says she can't find any eggs in the crow's nest. <laughs> well, tell her. Tell her I'll have the ship lay, too. He's given out the passports to the passengers, sir. Oh, God! Captain, 
Captain, I was about to it. Murder, sir. Murder? Aye, right, sir, a man shot in state room A. Who killed him, Stewart? I don't know. I was delivering the passport, sir. And I heard a shot. When I ran back to the room, the man was dead on the floor. Hey, state room's on this deck, mate. Let's go. Parker. Oh, Will I come too, Captain? No, Stewart. Let us go passport. Right, sir. This is state room A, Captain. Open that door, Ron. Help, help. My, sir, my husband. How long ago was your husband cut, madam? No, ten minutes ago, Captain. And you're just calling for help now? Yeah. When the shot was fired, I was eating lunch in the other room. First, I finished eating, and now I'm hollering. Listen, help, help. help. Quiet, quiet, please. Who shot your husband? That's a time to ask the room. Get a copper. What are you going to do, Captain? There's only one man can solve this mystery, mate. J. Edgar Hoover, sir? No, one long hand. Send the wire. I ask, sir. All police boats stand by. Calling Detective One Long Pan. Murder on the SS Veronic. Calling Detective One Long Pan. Come on, blow up your water wings, Long Pan. Tie that outboard motor to your Mandarin coat. Proceed to SS Veronic. Man murdered. Calling Detective One Long Pan. Hold on. Sleeping salutations. Hi, hello, Captain. Detective One Long Pan on job. With hey, many, many. Get your goat off. <laughs> Stole that cab, Long Pan. Exactly, Long Pan stole cab. As you stole, stole shall ye away. Stole away. <laughs> not bad, not good. Uh, maybe medium. <laughs> Quick, stolen Long Pan. There's been a murder aboard. Murder? You? Uh, who are you? Cop? Do I look like a cop? Uh, no, Long Pan. Part light. You're uh, you're dead from neck up. Why, you? You, you too. Who are you, White Star? I'm Captain Punk. And this is my boat, the SS Moronic. Very good. Captain Tunnel, SS Platonic. Nobody Platonic in trouble. <laughs> okay, for some. Now, oh, listen, are you going to solve this crime? Exactly. You, you, you tell Long Town what happened. Well, first we anchored a quarantine. Uh, anchor a submarine. Then I gave the men some orders. What, uh, what order? Get boom the port bow. Heave the anchor. The headroom for Cowley Spanker. <laughs> and then eight bells rang. Eight bells, they're bad. He stopped, say, man finds self behind eight bells, maybe end up corner pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Long time, silly Billy. Must hold in, must hold in. <laughs> oh, well, it's no use trying to explain anything to you. Come on, I'll show you the body. Happy suggestion. Take room A's right along this deck. Very good, very good. Maybe stop uh, steak room B. Take punch, uh, Jackie Penny. <laughs> well, it's right in here. Oh, coming in, Captain. This is one long pan, lady. I'm asking you to get a copper for your bringing a laundry man. <laughs> long pan, not laundry man, lady. Long pan, sunny tea man. Tea, as in the jello. Toto, as in the jello. <laughs> So if you are so smart, Mr. Hong Kong Hillbilly, who is killing my husband? First, uh, must you know a husband's name, lady? He is now the late Willoughby Cat, the Zipper King. <laughs> Willoughby Cat, uh, Zipper King. Do you see any clues, Long Pan? Long Pan, give body double O at the McIntyre. <laughs> uh, you see, uh, bullet hole in head, light under nose. No bullet hole, flamel. That's Willoughby's mouth. Well, uh, you say small mouth, eh? The seafoil, the seafoil. Well, there's a bullet hole over his heart, Long Pan. Look, it's quiet, Patinsky. Long Pan detective here. What is book? It's book here. Become sad. So that's a passport, Mr. Mopey Dopey. Mr. Mopey Dopey, Mr. Mopey Dopey. You a shot law, Mr. Waggy Tongue. One Long Pan less you for murder, Willoughby Cat. Why, you're nuts, Long Pan. Mrs. Cat has an alibi. What uh, lullaby? What lullaby? <laughs> when the shop was fired, she was in the next room eating. Positively. I was both in pickled herring with onions. How, Long Pan, no, you eat a pickled herring with onions. I will prove it by incision. If you will so kindly inhaling, I will exhaling. Go, go, go. Long Pan satisfied. Oh, oh. <laughs> lullaby, that is strong. Onion-like incinerator backfire. 
You're on the wrong track, Long Tan. He stop say man on long track soon get point. Oh, come at lip, come at lip. <laughs> My husband didn't have an enemy in the world. Thank God, maybe friends you're there. You know what's funny, Mr. Capside? <laughs> Mr. Capside holding his passport. Ah, uh, passport and port and clue. Long Pan has solo shot. Yeah, who shot him, Long Pan? Mad stowaway. Need passport, leave ship. Shoot Dipper King over Transom. So, why isn't he taking the passport? People here shoot, come pronto. Oh, that's right. The steward reported to my cabin right away. Very good. Stowaway, go away. Oh, Go away, go away, come and get some other day. <laughs> long pan, Johnny Edgar Gash. Go long way, go long way, wrong direction. <laughs> Captain, I am demanding you are catching the survey. Long pan, hall door. Captain Funnel, I assure you, come quickly, another passenger shot on the upper deck, sir. Hurry, six months we are cruising for help. So now the passengers are coming home dead. <laughs> It must be that mad doorway, Long Pan. Long Pan, stop murder. You lead way, Captain. There's another shot. This is terrible. Murder, next take long. Long Pan, investigate. You, uh, you go first, Captain. <laughs> You're yellow, Long Pan. No, no, not yellow. Long Pan, delightful orange pickle shade. <laughs> lead on, the next one. Okay. Help. Help! I'm Captain Funnel, Mr. Watson. My wife's been shot, Captain. Who oh, shot her wife, Mr. I don't know. I look. She's holding her passport, too. Same as Mr. Cat. Not die like a dog. Die like cat. <laughs> what does it all mean, Long Pan? Mean Matt Stowaway. Good at Matt now. Miss your passport second time. Well, my ship is ruined. This is three murders. Four murders, Captain. <laughs> all the turn, not in yet. Well, do something! Very good. Long pan, put all clams together, make a big pool, solve the wholesale. Well, where did that last shot come from? We try this room here. Was that shot in here, lady? Yes, this is awful, Captain. Your husband? Yes. Husband, uh, short throw a transom, lady? No, through his head, Fu Young. Fu Young, you too, lady. <laughs> Long pan, ask him a question. Well, look, Long pan, in his hand. Pass it, boy. Fucking don't be too much. Good. Return just come main and bum out. Captain Funnel, what were those two shots, Stuart? The Siamese twins in the next room have been murdered, sir. <laughs> Siamese twins or something in hand? Yes, they're passports. A coincidence. No, 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 not coincidence. Siamese twin die of puppet. Mystery solved. Well, it's a mystery solved, you dope. Where's the killer? Open mouth, shut eye, long tongue, give you a big surprise. No killer. What? You mean my husband here committed suicide? Exactly. Everybody kill self. Community suicide. Well, what caused it, long time? Very simple, very simple. Kitty play, kitty play. Captain Funnel here will demonstrate. What are you going to do, Captain? Don't ask me, lady. Ask Long Pan. Stuart, uh, you you have a uh, captain uh, passport? Yes, sir. It's right here. What's the Oriental idea? Quiet, uh, Barnacle William. Quiet. You look at your passport. Okay. You look at the uh, picture. Whale and catfish. Where's my gun? Don't shoot yourself, Captain. Oh, oh he's dead. Precisely. Experiment, great success. Captain join great majority. You mean they all kill themselves because... In Duba today, in Duba, in Duba, 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 Duba. <laughs> Any man prefer death to look like passport picture. What's the moral, Long Pen? Aesop say, passport photo is only x-ray picture with skin on. Some snappy dog, Long Pen likes packer, or oh, you kid. <laughs> Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the stage is being cleared for the next event at the town hall. The Mighty Allen Art players are being put back into their bottles, and Fred is giving the guest stars the last minute pep talk. I guess everything's ready. How about it, Fred? Everything's fine, Harry. Tonight, I think we'll reach a new high. I wouldn't be surprised if we get the show off the ground tonight. <laughs> Sounds well, Fred. 
Who have we got with us tonight? Well, some mighty fine acts, Harry. I have a virtuoso on the musical grasses, then a gentleman, Professor Quigley, a wonder worker, mm-hmm. and, uh, say, uh, not wishing to interrupt myself, but, uh, while I think of it, did you uh, hear Mr. B last Sunday? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Jack had a pretty good program, didn't he, Fred? You don't think it sounded any better just because it was coming out of the Waldorf Astoria, do you? <laughs> I'll bet he won't get his program in there again next Sunday without baggage. Why? <laughs> What do you mean, Fred? Jack didn't pull any faux pas at the Waldorf, did he? Why, that okay. You know, coming out, walking down the, one of the long halls there, he saw a lot of empty finger bowls stacked up on a table. You mean to say Jack didn't know what they were? He never saw a finger bowl before. He said, gosh, the next war is going to be terrible. They're making trench hats for children. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Imagine that guy driving up in front of the Waldorf in a trailer. <laughs> the doorman must have been plenty mortified. At the Waldorf? Yeah. The doorman at the Waldorf didn't even know what the trailer was. He thought one of the penthouses blew off the roof. <laughs> oh, say, uh, Fred, did you hear Jack say that you misinformed your radio audience? 400 people around the country? <laughs> he wouldn't know what it meant to cater to the 400. <laughs> Oh, and another thing I thought was funny was when he grilled little Stuart Canaan. The another thing. Wait a beat. minute. What was the first thing you thought was funny? <laughs> Never mind another thing you thought was funny. What was... <laughs> now, let's isolate that thing that was funny. What? Uh, when what, Jack what? flew off the roof. <laughs> oh. Uh, well, he's had plenty of practice flying off the handle. They can't... Uh, He's been modeling for at Hamaka Schlemmer's, you know, for hammers down there for a long time. He flies off the handle, and if the hammer can't do it, it's ready to sell. But you said about uh, little Stuart Canaan, the... Yeah, uh, he grilled the little fellow, you know. Oh, that little boy who played the bee. Mm -hmm. Why that big bully picking on a little fellow like Stuart... Benny's a bully, hey, Benny's a bully, hey, Benny's a bully, Benny's a bully. Why doesn't he pick on somebody your size? He's the kind of a guy who gives Shirley Temple a hot foot. <laughs> Why, of all the cowards, the last time he got into an argument with the Dion Quintuplets, he invited them outside one by one. <laughs> Wait a minute, Fred. Jack's all right. Why, I think I'll go over and see him next Sunday. Why, Wait a minute, Fred. You're not going to break up his program, are you? I'll tell him a thing or two. No, I I won't tax him mentally. I'll just tell him a thing. (laughs) Well... Now that that's all settled... It's all settled until Sunday. Now I'm going to put my venom on to Perk, and I hope to have it ready by Sunday night at 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, next Wednesday evening, Town Hall tonight brings you comedy. (laughs) Drama. My answer is final, Sir Gregory. You cannot have my hand. Very well, I shall play the cards I've got. Stock market report. Old American Bob Sled for a long pull. And music. <laughs> An hour of smiles in town hall tonight, folks. Fun with our star comedian Fred Allen. It's town hall tonight. <laughs> Fred Allen as he leads the parade to the old town hall. Fred's leading the band with a shillelagh and is followed by those green horns of the theater, the mighty Allen art players. Let's join the merry throng. Everybody join. Here they come, delicatessen leaders. Morris, why are you refusing to slice some corn beef for Mrs. Corn? The slicing machine is making steady on the radio, Sam, and it's town hall tonight. Spiritualist. Look, Professor Chell, the spirits are moving that radio up and down. The radio is merely dancing for joy, madam. It's town hall tonight. 
Reno divorces. Your grounds for divorce are cruel and inhuman treatment, Mrs. Bond? Yes, George. My husband always turns off the radio on Wednesdays in the town hall tonight. Well, sir, here we are before the old town hall. It's St. Patrick's Day, and Fred is welcoming the crowd with a brogue as folks pass inside. Let's listen. Bigari and the Jaber. Old King Cole was a merry old... A merry old soul, folks, and he got that way from coming to the old town hall. Single line, please. Hi not... there, booby boy. Hello, Jason. Is it here, Hi there, Mrs. Fumble. Step right in. You laugh, you shout like all get out on the inside. So hurry, hurry, hurry. We're all set inside, Fred. Surprising, Harry. <laughs> Peter's opening the show with swing high, swing low. Right, old Fred. Let her swing, Peter. Presenting that bombastic baron of big blatant bursts of bubbling, baffling buffoonery, bristling batter, and biangular oh, bread buttering, oh, blustering, Harry. blistering Fred Allen in person. Gosh, Harry, you left out Bristol and Myers. I don't know how. Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, before we preen our verbal feathers and prepare to give your risibilities a rousing tickling this evening, I hope, I'll read you the town hall bulletin for tonight. Hodge White, everybody's grocer, says that nothing's happened this week, folks, so there'll be no announcement. Yay! Thank you, friends. And now we'll get along with the town hall news. The curtain, Harry. Coming right down, Fred. <laughs> the lights go out, and we bring you the latest news of the week. The town hall news sees nothing, shows all. New York City, New York. Dr. R.P. Wodehouse, speaking at the American Institute of General Sciences, claims that hay fever and asthma are increasing in this country. Dr. Wodehouse says... Clearing up of native vegetation and its replacement by alien plants will add to number of victims. Town Hall News shows how sensitive some hay fever victims may become shortly. The scene, a train waiting room. We can sit down here, Wilbur. The 515 isn't ready. Yes, dear. Achoo. This is an idea. Is your hay fever starting? Yes, somebody's eating strawberries at the lunch counter. The, the straw starts to be sneezing. Strawberries. That reminds me. I forgot to phone the market about dinner. Have you got the number? Yes, it's hay market. Achoo! Don't, don't say hay market. You know that hay upsets me. Oh, right. I won't say another word. Achoo! What was that? I don't know. That woman just passed. Is she wearing a goldenrod corsage? I don't know. She's going by again. Achoo! Every time she walks by, I see. I'll tell her to get away from here. Oh, uh, pardon me, lady. Yes, sir. Did you call me? Achoo! Would you mind walking around the other way? You see, my husband... Are you intimating that I am ogling your husband? No, but why is it every time you pass, you start my husband's hay fever? I'm a grass widow. Achoo! Yes, sir. <laughs> New York City, New York. A new hit show opens on Broadway to delight New York theater goers. Critics guarantee evening of laughs to patrons attending play called Yes, My Darling Daughter. Town Hall News presents three-second review of this new laughing show, Yes, My Darling Daughter. Daddy, you say one word has made you the biggest man in Hollywood? That's right, daughter. What is the magic word, Daddy? Yes, My Darling Daughter. New York City, New York. East Side Merchants Association agrees to do away with men outside of clothing stores who approach customers and try to pull them into shops. Town Hall News shows old sales approach method on East Side when the puller in functioned outside of a clothing store. Monster sale going on inside. My dream bomb is sacrificing man suits. All kinds of bottles, herringbone, feet, chinchillas going across. Hey. How about a suit, brother? No. Hey, take your finger out of my buttonhole. Step inside. I'll show you a pencil scribed over breath that will knock your eye out. No, no, no. no. Get your hand out of my collar. No. You're stepping in, buddy? No, I'm not stepping in. Now, let me go. I got to catch a bus. You are needing a suit, brother. I don't need no suit. Now, quit pulling my lapel. You are needing a suit. Who said so? I am saying so. Look. What? Oh, what's the big idea ripping my lapel? I can't go home this way. That's what I'm saying. You are needing a suit. Step inside, brother. With the puller-in salesman of this type banished, Town Hall News shows the new methods customers can expect as they pass east side clothing stores in the near future. Hey, brother. 
Talking to me, mister? Yes, uh, confidentially, I'm needing a suit of garments. No. No, thanks. I just bought a suit with four pair of pants yesterday. You could use three coats, maybe, to go with the extra pair? No. Hey, quick. Up of my spine. Quick, Jeff. Inside the spot, Hey, I thought the east side stopped this pulling in business. So who's pulling you in, buddy? I'm pushing. <laughs> New York City, New York. New 20th century picture, Love is News, is held over a second week at the Roxy Theater. Produced by Darrow Zanuck, written by Harry Tugand and Jack Yellen, Love is News registers comedy triumph. Town Hall News brings you a ten-second preview of this excellent film, Love is News. Frank, I'll get your latest paper, read all about it. What's the headline, boy? Jack Benny and Fred Allen kiss and make up. Is that a front-page romance? And how, mister? With those two mudslingers, Love is News. <laughs> New York City, New York. Ship officers report stormy crossings on Atlantic Ocean. Record gales lash heavy seas, and ships experience trouble in navigating through storms. Town Hall News flashes candid camera shot of a terrible sea. The sea. <laughs> now, on Friday night, there will be an... Oh, God. Now, quiet, please. Look, if that is somebody left over from a... Uh, hello? Well, I'll say you've done, done it again, haven't you? <laughs> well, sir, the, the chairman laughed when I said I was going to take the floor. He didn't know the linoleum wasn't paid for. Well, it can lay there with the linoleum as <laughs> well. If it isn't Portland. Yes, Papa sent me over to see you. It's very important. What's important? Papa says you should make up your mind what night you're going to be on the radio. Well, you don't think just because I went on with Jack Benny last Sunday that the people are getting confused, do you? I'll say they are. I saw the man upstairs brushing his teeth with Jello this morning. <laughs> well... <laughs> See, you will get a life membership in the Don Wilson Foundation for that. You've saved them that much work next Sunday. Well, that doesn't make any difference. People brush their teeth with jello just as long as they don't try to buy iPanner and six delicious flavors. They'll be all right. Come in. Telegram for Fred Allen. Right here, boy. All right, sign here. Here's a pencil. Thank you, son. The boy's still waiting, Mr. Allen. Uh, thank you, son. Don't give me none of that, buddy. Now, see here. Listen, Greaseball, I don't mind not getting my tip, but when you try to cop my pencil, you're rubbing it in. Here's your pencil, Stickler. Okay, cheapskate. That boy's too fresh. Why don't you tear up the telegram and get even with him, Mr. Allen? No, he, you, uh, you read it. I, I've got to blow down my neck. Blow down your neck? Yes, I'm... I'm getting hot under the collar. I'll see who the telegram's from. All right. <laughs> what does it say? Dear Palsy Wowsy, happy birthday to you. I know it isn't your birthday, but I had to have an excuse to send you loads of love. Who sent that? It's signed Jack Benny. <laughs> oh, Jackie, hey. <laughs> He's a prince. Oh, there's a sweet guy, Portland. Good old Jackie. Gosh, he's so sweet, he's almost sticky. It's silly to send a birthday wire when it isn't your birthday. Listen, it isn't the stupidity. It's the sentiment gets me. There's the whitest guy I know. Yes, you said he was anemic. Now, listen, don't let anyone tell you Jackie Benny's anemic. He just stays white on purpose, so everybody else will look healthy. Gosh, Jack must have a big heart. Why, Jackie Benny's heart so big, you can put a stethoscope on him any place and get action. <laughs> Did you hear his program last Sunday? Yes. What was that static right in the middle of it? Static? Was it before or after Jack and I sang? It was during. During? 
Well, let me tell you something. A lot of people didn't catch our names when we sang. How do you know? Nelson Eddy got 300 wires from people who said they enjoyed his double voice solo. Gosh, to me it sounded like two wildcats picketing a pet shop. Two wildcats picketing a pet shop. <laughs> do you know that the next morning after Jackie and I sang at the Pierre... All of the flowers bloomed in Central Park. They thought the robins were back from the south. That's done it. Next there's That's low. done it. It's well, don't bring right, it. babe, you don't have to page humble blow. Just drop a hint. I can hear it before it hits the ground. Come on up, Casper. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Portland. I don't mind you bringing people in here, but when they're all wet, they leave puddles. Now, listen, Ham... You ought to be flattered to be seen with a couple of good eggs. Ho, ho. That's telling them, Casper. Ho, ho. Is Casper saying something, Mr. Blow? Only a simpleton can understand Casper. That's why he's talking to himself. Well, you ought to be able to catch Casper's drift, bud. Ho, ho. Somebody ought to... Somebody ought to put a sign on Casper's mouth, open by mistake. Now, take it easy, brother. Yeah. You're jeopardizing the friendship of Humbert Blow, the outstanding theatrical agent of this generation. Mr. Blow furnishes all kinds of talent, Mr. Allen. Oh, oh, and how. Why, Casper here can put the program on a map, simple. What does Casper do? Imitation. Right. Name your sounds, folks, and Casper goes to town. How about a, uh, a fin calling to its haddie? Quit clowning, bud. How about molasses coming out of a jug? Okay, let's go, Captain. Oh, wait a minute. Uh-uh, wait a minute. Molasses in this weather will take too long. Okay, give us a ginger ale bottle, Casper. It sounded like somebody with false teeth munching castanets to me. Well, you ain't had nothing yet. What's next, Casper boy? Oh, oh, a lion. Why, folks? One lion! Take it away, Casper! <laughs> How's that, knobhead? It sounded like the Holland Tunnel backfiring to me. Hey, no belittling, bud. Can Casper do a Jersey cow, Mr. Blow? Well, Jersey's too far away. You wouldn't hear it. Uh, how about a New York cow? Listen, the only thing that gives milk in New York is a waiter. Coconuts give milk, Mr. Allen. Yeah, what about philanthropy? Never mind, never mind. Give us the cow. Okay. One Holstein, Casper. Two. <laughs> A foghorn. Okay, blast, Casper. <laughs> so that's a foghorn. It sounded like you and Jack Betty singing, Mr. Allen. Now, you leave my pal out of this. And now, folks, with your kind attention, Casper entertain his one and all with his own original barnyard community sing. What? Mr. Blow. It's a foul choir. Foul is right. <laughs> Quiet, dope. Give us that Plymouth Rock Ensemble, Casper. Oh, boy, some chicken's all right. Casper done everything but lay an egg, sister. He didn't lay an egg, he spread an omelet. <laughs> Radio. I'm hiring him to break a lease in a boiler factory. Why, you? We better beat it, fellas. Nice exterminating, Portland. <laughs> so long. Howie. Ho, ho. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we present the little group that inspired that song's success, This Year's Hisses, the mighty Alan Arclayer. 
Tonight, they present a backwoods drama entitled The Great Hillbilly Battle, or Harsh Words Don't Always Start a Feud. It's when somebody says, oh, shoot. Over to you, Peter. <laughs> Uh, oh, quick, quick, uh, quick, quick, pardon me. What, what is it, Sarah? Give out, you lazy juggins. Well, it ain't, ain't hardly daylight yet. Past daylight. The sun's slow this morning. Yeah, well, everything ready? Yep, your rifle's loaded and the coffee's on. Good, I'll, uh, I'll take a shot over at the Carver's cabin. Let them varmints know we're up and prayer and feud. Uh, take that, you lout. Uh. Any luck? Well, I don't know, I... Shot low into the cabin. Case old Carver sleeping on the floor. Oh, there goes our last winder. Yep, the Carver's is up. <laughs> They're tardy this morning. I'm getting sick of this field in, Eli. I ain't been out this cabin for nigh on 40 years. And you gotta stunt your wanderlust, Sari. <laughs> For the last 200 years, us Allens has been feuding the Carvers. Three generations, Allens, has been born, farmed, feuded, and died without leaving this here room. Well, it's mighty convenient, but that's all. My uh, great-grandpa Luther's buried yonder under that uh, butter churn there. <laughs> Grandma Nell's and Uncle Dud's tombstones were using for bookends for Pilgrim's Progress. <laughs> And you're a-standing on Cousin Nathan right now. It's going to be mighty stuffy in here on Resurrection Day. Don't ding them, cover. Clean through the wall. Where'd that, where'd that bullet go? Yonder in the potato patch under the bed. Well, I'll, I'll just take another pop at them vandals. Uh, you can take this, you prairie, you bangers. There, uh, I'll show them. Well, that's all the feuding I can go on an empty belly. I'll get you breakfast. Is, uh, awake? I can't tell. He's too lazy to shed his eyes. He sleeps with them open. Pa, pa, pa. Yes. wake up. Pa, wake hey, up. Jeepers, creepers, son, I'm awake. Lord, right through Lydia Pinkham's picture. Uh, them mangy carvers? Got him, son. I will. Take this, you snakes. Uh, right through that keyhole by there. Say, what's for breakfast? Owl a la king again? <laughs> no, no. No poultry this morning, Pa. Nothing but coffee. Uh, ain't there no bacon, Ma? Only what's left on the hog. How many hogs we got left, son? Just the old sow, Bessie. Better to fetch her then, Eli. Uh, right enough, Sarah. Come out here to your doom, Bessie. Oink, 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 oink. Then I'll oink, get my rifle. Here, yeah, now, hold on. You ain't wasting our ammunition, son. Well, I can't do jitsu at a deaf bar. She'll pass out real All right, right Paul. You watch your bacon relax, don't you? Yes, well, just put the pig outside the door. The carvers will shoot her. It'll save us a bullet. <laughs> That's cutting down the budget, Pa. Come on, Bessie. Oink, oink, oink. I'll tie a rope onto her so she can't run away. Yep, yep, and uh, better put your hat on the pig, son. Afraid your bacon will catch cold, Pa? <laughs> no, no, but if old man Carver sees a pig with a hat on, he'll think it's you creeping out the cabin on your stomach. <laughs> he's, uh, he's sure to shoot. Well, okie be dokey, I'll, I'll put my Stetson on her. Steady, Bill. That looks better on the pig than it does on you, son. <laughs> oh, go shuck your soft corn, Pa. You open the door, Sarah. Over, Bessie. Get, Bessie. Right between the eyes. Well, one thing about this few is you get service. Drag a really like. Okay, but okay. Oh, are you? Ma'am, are you? Ma'am. I'll close the door. Yeah, set her over here near the stove, son. I'll uh, amputate some bacon. Hey, you! Something funny! It's you, Pa. You got one of your feet on that red hot stove. Which foot, son? <laughs> it's your left one, Pa. Gosh, two of your toes is clinkers. Well, could be worse. I still got three toes left. <laughs> Lord, I wish you'd wash your feet, Pa, for you grill them. Wash them. Wash them for what? I ain't showing off at my age. 
You ought to stand up someday, Pa. I'll surprise your feet. Well, there goes breakfast. Carver just shot the coffee pot off in the stove. Adam, son? Yeah. Take this, you rat face scum. <laughs> Bully for me. Well done, Eli. Yeah. Old Carver was making a sign at me. Well, sir, I shot his thumb out from between his nose and his forefinger. <laughs> Nice aiming, son. There's the postman. No shooting, Eli. No, postman's got the right of way. It's the only thing us and the carvers grease on. <laughs> Open the door, somebody. I'm hauling gingham, Pa. Howdy, Bo. Howdy, Howdy Abner. Abner. Showed us any mail, Abner? Just your morning batch of insults from the carvers. Yeah? What were the mouth venoms carver up to today? Well, to start off with, he says... You Allens are so low, they'll have to jack you up to bury you. <laughs> Why, them rodent eating trash, them weed munching mongrels. Ditto for me, too. Anything else, Abner? Yep, here's Carver's thought for the day. Let's have it. Well, Carver says, you're so all fired mean, you wouldn't eat in front of a mirror for fear your reflection had asked you for a bite. <laughs> Why, that narrow-minded misfit? Any reply? You can bet your bottom postcard there's a reply. You can tell Carver for me. He's so filthy. The last time he met a skunk face to face, the skunk went home with an inferiority complex. <laughs> that ought to write him. Yep, and here's my thought for the day. You can tell that drooling, fork-footed, snuff-dipping gopher that he's so undernourished his idea of high living is dipping his bread into a rabbit track before he eats it. <laughs> Anything else? Well, that'll hold Carver for the day, I guess. Well, I'll get long. Can't hold up the mail. So long. Oh, well, yeah. well Carver will have to go some to answer them insults. Yeah, them squirrels will grit him up proper. <laughs> if there's some Hector don't to come home, he could help us with the fuel. Hector's the only Alan ever escaped from the cabin. Say, hey, how'd he get away? I was sleeping that spring. Hector was only four when he stampeded 20 years ago. Yep, creeped right out of the cabin. Kid was so hairy and dirty looking, Carver thought he was a possum. Funny he never said no word. Well, Hector might have crawled into a gopher hole and quit the human race. You can't tell. Well, oh, man back, Jim. Abner must have forget one of them insults we mailed to Carver. Well, open the door. Hello, folks. Who is it, Eli? Don't know, Pa. It's Abner's suit, but a stranger is sporting it. Don't you know me, Ma? Who are you, butter cheese? Why, I'm Hector, Ma. Your male brat that got away 20 years ago. If you're sure enough, Hector, what you doing in that mailman's get up? Well, Abner let me wear it so old Carver wouldn't pick me off coming up the trail. Are you Hector Honor Bright, Bulgy? Right as rickets, Grandpa. Just bust into town on a greyhound. Riding dogs is mighty dangerous, Hector. How'd you loll away your youth, Sam? Been studying at Barber College, Paul. Graduated last week with high honors. Magna cum cyburns. <laughs> uh, what's the uh, latest news out yonder, Hector? Uh, do we still holding them off at Manila? <laughs> just, uh, just gather the rest folks around and I'll give you all the news. Where all that's left, Hector? Why, where's Uncle Dud? Uncle Dud leaned out to spit in 27. <laughs> Carver's got him. Grandma, too? Yep, yeah. She opened the door to shake the broom. They got Grandma between the dustpan and the broom handle. <laughs> Your Ma and me's carrying on the feud short-handed, Hector. Then I just got home in time. Sure did, son. I'll oil your gun. No, I ain't shooting, Pa. I came home to stop the feud. You ain't a going to throw your Pa out of work, Hector. Are you catched, son? No, Pa. I'll come back to bring you tidings. Tidings? What tidings? Well, sir, the president's got a scheme to help folks like you. You can tell McKinley he can mind his old god dang business. Now, take McKinley, Pa. It's Roosevelt. Well, we don't want him and his Rough Riders a button in, other. Now, sir. No, now, this is another Roosevelt president now. He's got a scheme called uh, sociable security. What's it like, uh, bingo? No, it ain't no gamble, Pa. When you get to be 65, you get paid. Paid for what? For being 65. It's, uh, it's a reward like. What's that? <laughs> What's that got to do with your ma and me? Well, you got to stop feuding. 
If you both get killed off before you get to be 65, you won't get paid. Hey, uh, are you sure the government's giving real money? Yeah, it's real money, all right, with eagles on it for spending. Well, money makes the mayor go, and I can feel the horse coming out of me. Hey, that sounds tempting. We ought to call off the fuel. Now, hold on. Suppose we stop feuding and Carver keeps on a going. Carver's willing to fuel me. Abner pumped him yesterday. Fair enough. Might as well give in, Eli. Well, yeah, might as well, son. It's real money. Come on, Paul. Well, uh, okay, but okay. The fuel's over. Hooray! Now, wait, now, wait. Hold on. Before there's any more cheering, when do I get paid? Right away. Here's your sociable security blank, Paul. All you got to do is sign your name right. Now, load your guns, folks. The fuel's back on. What's eating you, Paul? What's on that gun, Eli? Hold on, son. You ain't a-passing up that money. You heard my battle cry. The fuel's on. What? You mean you'd rather die fighting than sign your name to this blank, Paul? I ain't got no choice, son. You know I can't write my name. Come on, you cover. <laughs> Hollywood with our star comedian Fred Allen, who tonight brings us Jack Benny. It's Town Hall Tonight! <laughs> Listen to that crowd cheer as Fred Allen leads his parade of stars to the old town hall. Fred's leading the band dressed as Santa, followed by those claws in the theater side to the mighty Allen Art players. Let's join the happy crowd, folks. Everybody's going... What's the milk of you can't bring the speed record at the end of the day? I must go, Bean. I've got to get to my radio in a hurry. It's town hall tonight. Ballooning. You just came down, Professor Kickard. Why are you taking your balloon up again? The radio reception is better in the state of fair lady. It's town hall tonight. Deep sea divers. Don't tell me you've located a sunken treasure in that wreck, Bill. Yeah, there's a radio down there that still works, and it's Jack Benny tonight. Well, sir, here we are before the old town hall, and there's Fred with an old oil lamp making light of the folks as they pass inside. Let's listen. Eeny, meeny, miny, and the mole the merrier, folks. All roads lead to the old town hall. Now, don't jostle, madam. Come Hi on. there, crook voice. Hi, Pez. Hello, Mrs. Sider. Is Jack Benny here tonight, Mr. Allen? Not all here, but all there is of Benny you'll find on the inside with a joke or tune, and we're starting soon. So hurry, hurry, hurry. Presenting that zealous star of Zazu Zaz, Zithery B, Xylophone Zephyrs, Idolatings and Ambulance Satire, Zanuck Zaney of the Cinema, Fred Allen in person. Hello again. This go is Jack away. Benny talking. Go away. Go away, boy. Oh, all right. See, right away. Get away from this microphone here. Good evening. We must get a weather strip put on the hall. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we have a nice night for it this evening. And before the Hollywood Weather Bureau butts in with a commercial to take the credit for the weather, I'll read you the town hall bulletin for tonight. Hodge White, the first grocer to sell bacon sliced so thin that the streaks had to be pinned to the fatty part, has a special announcement. Hodge says that during the cold spell, he's taking out his dial phone and putting in one of the old stylers, folks. Hodge says you can't use a dial phone with your mittens on, and it's so doggone cold in the store, if you take your mittens off, it'll frost your hangnail. So until it warms up, Hodge is inviting all mitten lovers to stop in and phone in comfort. So much for smart customer appeal around the village, and now for the town hall news. The curtain, Harry. Uh, for certain, Fred. The curtain for certain. A long fella, eh? Hey? Oh, I'm only five foot two, Fred. The lights go out, <laughs> and we bring you the latest news of the week. The town hall news sees nothing, shows all. Washington, D.C., Government Weather Bureau predicts that backbone of recent cold wave is broken and nation can expect moderate temperatures for, from now on. Town Hall News checking on recent snowstorms and below zero weather around the country 
interviews prominent citizens affected. Tales of strange happenings are rampant in the land as a result of recent cold. At Bill Dad, Nova Scotia, Mr. Tufton Pump gives off-record statement. How did you find the recent snap, Mr. Pump? It's the worst storm I've seen in these parts in the past ten years, uh, all but one year. Didn't you uh, see a storm that year? I didn't see nothing that year, son. I broke my glasses. I... I see. Well, how cold was it, Mr. Pump? Well, to give you a rough idea, our Townsend Club gave a community sing last week, and they called on me to solo. What happened? It was so doggone cold, I opened my mouth to sing Old Man River... What came out? An icicle, two choruses long. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Pump. At Eclair, Wisconsin, Mrs. Nadine Wine, a housewife, tells her strange story. You say it was real stormy, Mrs. Wine. Lord, yes. Snow was so high yesterday, folks going by the house were stooping down to look in my transom. Was it, uh... Was it uncomfortable indoors? I was chilled so bad, I shook half the spots off a polka dot Mother Hubbard. Must have been cold, all right. It was plum bitter. Why, I sat down on a chair and thought I had a frostbite. <laughs> Wasn't it frostbite? No, I was setting on to my false teeth for lower. Thank you, Mrs. Wine. At Rockaway Beach, New York, four dice Vestbaum, retired pushcart baron had ghastly experience in the cold way. What took place, Mr. Messbaum? Why, what's happening to me should happen to a polar bear. Did the uh, cold affect you physically? Not only physically, but financially. Really? What happened? For 15 years, my neighbor gold club, a tight bud, but a good one, is owing me $4. Yesterday in our blizzard, I am meeting gold club. Face to face? Beard to beard, we are meeting. <laughs> the temperature is below. Below zero? Below zero is asking. On top of the mic, Harry Zero is looking like a halo yet. <laughs> but what about Gold Slob? Gold Slob, all of a sudden getting sociable, is saying, Miss Brown, for 15 years I'm owing you $4. And today you are catching me and I'm with the settle. Did you get the money? Well, I'm putting out my hand in the cold to take it. And lo and give out, I'm hearing something dropping. Was it the $4? What $4? It was four of my fingers. A climber, boy. Thank you, Mr. Messbaum. <laughs> At Hollywood, California, Miss Fern Fickle, loyal Californian, denies the very existence of a cold wave. You say you didn't observe the sudden change in temperature, Miss Fickle? In California, one doesn't discuss the weather with strangers, mister. Why, uh, not with strangers, huh? <laughs> Only entre nous. Why, it was freezing. It was freezing last week. Oh, yes. Zero night. The Chamber of Commerce arranges it annually. Uh, it's to help people with swimming pools. The Chamber of Commerce wants your swimming pools to freeze? Yes. Once a year, we tip up the ice and sweep out the bottom of the pool. You Californians take the cake. No, we lower it back in the pool instantly. You deny... You deny... <laughs> You deny the existence of bad weather here in Hollywood recently? As a loyal Californian, I do. Why, it was so cold last night, I saw hail coming down. Not hail, tourists. You might have seen some puffed rain, but not hail. <laughs> this is California. Thank you, Miss Fickle. <laughs> Many farm tenants report unusual happenings. At Pine Snuff, Arkansas, Farmer Conway Straggle is interviewed in his barn. Don't you feel the cold here in your barn, Farmer Straggle? You're darn tootin', stranger. So cold in here right now, I'm steam heating them hens nests. You, uh, you have to heat the nests? Sure do. How'd you like to sit down in a nest of cold straw and try to lay an egg? Well, I, uh... Me neither, son. <laughs> Does the... <laughs> Does the cold bother your cows? You betcha. Milk freezes right in them. I've been getting it out in sticks. <laughs> Milk steaks? Yeah. Well, look, I'll show you. Uh, I'll uh, move over there, Bessie. Mm -hmm. uh, quiet. I'll milk her for you. <laughs> All right. Easy, Bessie. Take it easy. Now, watch this. The milk comes out about a foot, and it freezes, and I snap her off. Mm -hmm. Farmer Straggle, break me off a pint and I'll take it with me. Well, I'll take that. 
These flashes have given you an idea of the present-day machine age cold wave, ladies and gentlemen. But in the mind of the oldest inhabitant, the outstanding cold wave ever to sweep this country occurred during the winter of 1871. On the night of January 2nd, 1871, the mercury took a 52-degree drop. The drop. And now, much as it pains me, and will you, may I present... Jello again. This is Jack Benny talking. Will you go away? <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, you didn't expect to meet... Jello again. This is Jack Benny talking. Will you get, a, will you get away from here? Is this Wednesday night or not? Well... <laughs> I was saying, ladies and gentlemen, now, uh, on Friday night, the Port Jervis String Ensemble... Uh, Do you mind if I interrupt, Mr. Allen? Why, no, Portland. Into each life, some rain must fall, unless unless one lives in Palm Springs, of course. Or, unless one is an old maid. What is an old maid to do with no rain falling in her life? If an old maid never gets married, she never gets a shower, does she? (laughs) Tell her shower as long as she's healthy. What is this? Well, I've got a big surprise for you tonight, Mr. Allen. Big surprise? Now, look. Portland, this is the day of digest publications, conce- concentrated foods, and capsule criticism. Couldn't you sense the trend and show up with a little surprise? But this is the biggest thing you've had on the program this year. Hello again for the fourth time. <laughs> now look, Portland, a thing on the program we don't need. Stuff I don't mind, but not a thing. <laughs> Mr. Allen, it isn't a thing. This is an old friend of yours from the days of Bozeville. If it's Otto the train seal, throw him a fish and tell him I'm busy. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Fred. If you'll just take your nose, that one you used to talk through, out of that microphone, <laughs> you'll see that it's me. Oh, Jack! Jack Benny! Well, I'm ter- Wait a minute. There's a reception goes in there. Well, it doesn't have... <laughs> there for a minute. Well, you've been on four times. If you want took a little bit each time, it's better you get it all at once like this. Let it pile up. Well, I'm terribly sorry, Jack. I didn't notice you. How long have you been standing there? Since eight o'clock this morning. They've been using me instead of the bull of a watch time. Hey, Jack, did Mary come along with you? No, Portie. She wanted to come over, but she's busy with her Christmas shopping. Christmas shopping? Yeah, right now she's over at Bullets Wilshire putting me through bankruptcy. <laughs> that gives me an idea. Tally ho, Jack. So long, Forty. Well, Jack, this is quite a surprise, you dropping in. I didn't know you were going to be here tonight. I didn't know it either, Fred, until I heard you announce it five times last week. <laughs> But don't get me wrong, Freddy. I appreciate that build-up. I'm one guy who knows that it pays to advertise. Now, listen here, Benny. If that's a hint, you're not getting one cent for crawling in here tonight, and you know it. (laughs) Why, Fred, I... uh, Really, I didn't expect to get paid for this. I haven't any more right to take money for working on this program than you have. (laughs) armchair jokes. They'll hold you for a while. Now, hold on there. Hold on there, Benny. That's an insult. Well, if I, if I was Professor Quiz, I'd say correct. Absolutely correct. And if I was Major Bowes, you'd have left with a unit ten minutes ago. Hey, that's nice work if you can get it. You know, Freddie... I wouldn't mind being back in Vaudeville again, though, would you? Ah, those were the good old days. Yes, sir. Say, Fred, no kidding, will you ever forget the time you and I were together at the Orpheum Theater in Sioux City, Iowa? Yep. Only I was on the stage. (laughs) I don't care, Freddie. I made more money selling peanuts in one day than you did all week. (laughs) Well, 
Well, Jack, I didn't make much money in those days, but I was a pretty good juggler. Remember how I used to toss those Indian clubs in the air and do a funny monologue at the same time? I sure do. And, Fred, you remember when you dropped those clubs? How you'd let them lay there right alongside of your jokes? <laughs> You ought to know, you swept up the theater every night. I did not. I used to stay in the theater late just to practice my violin. Yeah, you should have stuck to your broom. I should have stuck to my own program, too. Right? I had to ask for this yet, too. Well, you had to write well, it yet, to insult you. Well, Fred, anyway, a lot of water has gone over the darn since then, huh? Over the darn? Yes, Fred, you know how careful we have to be. <laughs> but just think, Freddie, just think, here we are, both in Hollywood and both of us in pictures. It does seem unreasonable, doesn't it? <laughs> of course, Fred, maybe I shouldn't point this out, but I, uh... I do make a lot more pictures than you do. Well, Jack, there's so little of you in each one, you have to make more. Oh, is that why they do it? I'm glad you brought that up. How do you like pictures, Fred? Fine, Jack. I just finished one called Sally, Irene, and Mary. I'm leaving for New York next week. Oh, they're releasing you instead of the picture. <laughs> now, Benny, if you're here to drip venom... Heed your promiscuous spattering, and remember that retribution is the trailer that follows oral pollution. Alan, you're just lucky. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> anyway, I had a hunch you were going back east, Fred, and that's why I came up here to see you. Have you decided uh, which way you're going back? I mean, uh... Which form of transportation? Well, I was going to take the boat and go through Panama. But I've got a hat, so oh. I decided to... Uh, <laughs> I decided to take the train. Well, Fred, I, of course, I don't want to influence you one way or the other, but uh, have you ever thought of driving back east? You know, by automobile? Uh, what kind of an automobile? Now, don't rush me. <laughs> And it's in good condition, too. Would you like to drive back home, Freddie? No, Jack. I'll uh, I'll stick to the chief. Well, if you'd rather hang around with India. But the chief is a train, as you will find out when you finish your next picture, Mr. Benny. <laughs> Say, what are you trying to get at, anyway? Well, Fred, I own a Maxwell. And I thought that... You if... don't think you can palm that tin nightmare off on me, I hope. Why, I wouldn't be found dead in that car. Say, you're no better than the engine. <laughs> Why, the engine in that steam cabinet is so dead, the front wheels are nothing but rubber pallbearers. <laughs> Where is that uncovered wagon? It's right outside the door. Hey, boys, boys. Yes, hey, uh, Will you drive my Maxwell in, please? Sure, sure. Now, be careful, fellas. It's a high-powered car there, you know. Right in here, boys. Right in here. Well, uh, want us to leave it right here, Mr. Benny? Yes, yes, thanks, fellas. Hey, what, what's that noise? Noise? I'll cut off the motor so we can hear it. That's better. Yes. Hey, uh, Mr. Benny, I guess this belongs to you. Oh, the door. Yes, thanks. <laughs> to close it and it came off in my hand. <laughs> well, you can stick it back on with a little new skin, Jack. <laughs> Say, what's that bottle of scotch doing tied on the front? That's for the radiator on New Year's Eve. <laughs> it looks like the car's got a hangover already. Benny, you may not be a snake in the grass, but you're sure hanging around with a rattler there. <laughs> That's libel, Alan. And if I had my writers here, what we'd call you... <laughs> Four bell ran. <laughs> hey, what the... Hey, who shot him? <laughs> hey, what was that? Did the engine drop out? No, Smarty, it's the new sunken motor. <laughs> and listen to this horn. <laughs> that note is by Stakowski. <laughs> well, how, how, is, how is the car on gas? Well, I get about four miles to the court. <laughs> 
Uh, if I insist, of course. If you, uh, uh, if you put your foot down. Yes, yes. Well, uh, <laughs> how much does that make to the gallon? Well, I never put in a gallon. I don't believe in spoiling a car. You know how it is with gas tanks. Easy come, easy go. Well, Alan, what do you say? Well, now that I've had a good look at this bear trap, Jack, I know why the Maxwell people went into the coffee business. <laughs> I'm not begging you to take this car, only I thought, well, you walk all the time, you're not getting any younger. I think you ought to take your varicose veins out for a spin once in a while. What are you asking for this Rhapsody and Junk? I'm asking $95 FOB. FOB for old Benny. <laughs> Hey, and you don't know <laughs> laughing at your next Sunday show already. Right? Can't wait. If you don't know, I'd give a thousand dollars if I could think of an answer right now. If you don't know by now that I don't want that car, you ought to have your skull thin. All right, Fred, as long as you don't want to buy it, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll wrap it in cellophane, tie a big red ribbon around it, and give it here for Christmas. How's that? If I wake up Christmas morning and find that monstrosity in my stocking, I'll go barefooted the rest of my life. <laughs> that would be nothing new for you, you hillbilly. <laughs> so you don't even want it for a present, huh? I don't want it present, past, or future. You can take that animated skillet. All right, Fred, all right. I merely wanted to be a good fellow, that's all. <laughs> you don't want the car, and I think you don't. I'll be on my way. No hard feelings, I hope. No, Jack, I haven't anything against you, not Benny the man. No. I'm just not in the market, that's all. I hope I didn't offend you. Oh, no, Freddy, I'll just have to sell it to some other uh, guy. <laughs> well, Merry Christmas, old boy. Same to you, Jack, and good luck. Thanks, Freddy. Goodbye. What was that, Jack? That's what my car thinks of you, Alan. Go on, everybody. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, very well done, Master Benny. You've come a long way since the last time we met. <laughs> gentlemen, we bring you those theatrical termites who have gone through their artistic lives trying to bring down the house, the mighty Allen Art Players. Tonight they present a Christmas fable. It's called Santa Claus Sits Down or Jingle Bells Shall Not Ring Tonight. Over to you, Peter. This is station NG, NG, folks. Our next program will be... Just a minute, folks. Here's a bulletin from the Radio News Bureau. A rumor has just reached us that Santa Claus will not ride this Christmas. Unconfirmed reports ride throughout the country that Santa Claus is on sit-down strike. What's going on in Santa Claus's igloo? Stand by, folks. Assassinated Press is investigating the trouble, and we hope... <laughs> is this the Santa Claus igloo? Yes, I'm Mrs. Claus. Well, I'm Phil B. of the Assassinated Press. I'm here to check on this rumor that Santa Claus refuses to ride this year. Oh, I'm glad you come. I've been fighting with him all week, and he refuses to budge. Well, where is Santa Claus now? Oh, the old fool's in the next room sulking. I'll get him. Hey, Santa! Oh, it ain't no use coaxing, Ma. Oh, you ain't going. <laughs> come on out, stupid. You got company. Oh, well... What's on your mind, son? Well, I'm from the Assassinated Press, Santa Claus. Now, what's this idea? Oh, here? no, I, I ain't riding now. But this is Christmas Eve. Trees are lit up. Millions of children have hung up their stockings. The whole world is oh, waiting. Well, regardless, I ain't riding. Ain't no use, mister. He's stubborn. No, I ain't stubborn neither. I'm sick of being Santa Claus, holding the bag every year. <laughs> Well, you must have a reason for quitting. I got plenty of reasons. Well, will you talk for the press? Yeah, uh, might swell, I guess. Well, now, Santa, why won't you ride tonight? Well, I'll tell you, son. It's a long story. 
I've been closing it for 1937 years, son. I've been a bringing presents, toys for kiddies, loud neckties and handkerchiefs for grown-ups. Every Christmas trying to spread joy. But my efforts down through the ages has been a bit of disappointment. My intentions has been good, but my reward has been nothing but grief. The first trouble I had was in ancient Rome. It was Christmas Eve in the court of Nero. The emperor was playing a violin concerto. Is your emperor the best fiddler in Rome, Lackeys? Yes, Nero! Is your king a master of pizzicato? Yes, Nero! Shall Nero play an encore? No, Nero! What? You dog! Be gone, hypocrite! Clear my throne room! Yes! Ah, now I can play my violin. I'm alone. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Uh, what's this? What fell out of my chimney? Merry Christmas, Nero. Merry Christmas. Who are you, Lumpkin? The chimney sweep? I'm Santa Claus, Nero. Bearing Christmas gifts for your majesty. Cad Zooks, another basket of fruit from the Rome Kiwanis Club. <laughs> No, my gift is a trinket rare. So rare, it hasn't even been invented yet. Watkins, what is this tiny golden box? It's a cigarette lighter, Nero. Turn your little wheel. Gramercy, it flames. It flames. Merry Christmas, Nero. Oh, it flames. Rome has scoffed at my fiddle. Nero will have his revenge. Hey, watch that light, Nero. You're setting fire to the drapery. I'm setting fire to all Rome. Revenge! Look out! Revenge. Nero! Ah. He's dead. Ah. Ah. So you see, son, if it wasn't for Santa Claus, Rome wouldn't have burned. Well, I know that, but... Here I... I was trying to spread good cheer, and what did I get? Singed whiskers. But that was 2,000 years ago. Nero was only the start of my trouble, son. A few centuries later, I had trouble in a little country to the north of England. That Christmas, I had a present for a young poet. I peeked in the window. He was writing a sonnet. His mother come into the room. Bobby! Bobby! I'm ever... It's time you were a bed, lad. I'm composing, mother. Have you not heard them a poet? A poet at your age. Rubbish. I am Robbie Burns, the youngest poet in the Glen. Are you concocting a limerick, lad? No, it's a song, mother. Listen. By yon bonny banks and by yon bonny bray, where me and my two love were ever once to... It's no finish. Oh, I can't think of a rhyme for bray. Uh, pay. Pay in a Scotch song? Are you a daft, mother? To be last on the hit parade. <laughs> well, you'd better find a rhyme in a hurry and go to bed. Composing on Christmas. It's evil. Good night. Good night, mother. Oh, a rhyme. Bray, play, day, Chevrolet. Ho, 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 ho. Chimney. I'm Sandy Claus, Bobby Burns. Merry Christmas. What's your business, Red Britches? <laughs> I'm Santa Claus, Bobby. I brought you something here. A rhyme and dictionary. Good one, let me look. I pray, ray, say, stray. Where me and my true love were ever want to stray. I a bonny rhyme. I've written a gem. Merry Christmas, Bobby. Uh, how much are you asking for the rhyme and dictionary, Claus? It's Christmas, Bobby. I'm giving it to you. Giving it? Help! Feather, help! Oh, Feather! What's wrong, son? This man's a lunatic, Feather. A daft Sandy, eh? Hey? I'm Santa Claus, Mr. Burns. I only gave Bobby a Christmas gift. Give him? Grab him, now, son. Let me we'll go. take him to the asylum. Hold on, Mr. Burns. I only gave your son a present. Exactly. A man who gives anything away in Scotland belongs in a padded cell. Grab him, son. Scotland. I was in the booby hatch there for 30 days. But that was 200 years ago. I know. But a few Christmases later, I got a raw deal in another suburb of England. It was called the American colonies. I dropped in at the house of some fellow named Paul Revere. His wife was preparing dinner as Paul came through the door. 
Christmas dinner ready, Effie? Yes, Paul. Pull up a chair. No, no. Set my plate on the mantelpiece. Can't you sit down yet, Paul Revere? Why, that land was... That ride was last April. Uh, through every Middlesex village and farm ain't once around Central Park, Effie. So you ought to try and sit down for Christmas, Paul. It'd be a nice present for your spine. Uh, who's that? Might be a British spy, Paul. The word is full of them. Hand him a gun. I'll talk to him through the door. Who's there? Merry Christmas, Paul Revere. It's Santa Claus. So what? I've got your Christmas present, Paul. It's a cushion stuffed with fuzz from Delaware Peaches. Can I sit onto it? You bet. Sounds mighty tempting, Effie. I'll let him in. It might be a British trick, Paul. Don't open that door. I'm Santa Claus, Mrs. Revere. Open up. I've got my gun, Effie. I'll open the door. A crack. Merry Christmas, Paul. Look at his suit, Paul. A red coat. Take this. Now, whoa, now, Paul. Well, sir, when I got back to my sleigh and sought down, I was mighty glad I still had that cushion full of peach fuzz. You see, son, the world's given old Santa plenty of trouble. But all these troubles were years ago, Santa Claus. People appreciate you today. You're wrong, son. Only last Christmas, I went down to a place called Washington, D.C. I got confused and went down the wrong chimney. I come out in some office. Coming down the chimney, I heard a man phoning. Hello? Hummingbird Conservation Project, Professor Beek speaking. Two million dollars for a hummingbird community bird bath in Florida. I'll mail you a check Monday. Goodbye. <laughs> here, what are you doing here? Merry Christmas. I'm Santa Claus. Santa Claus? One of the Wagner Act clauses? No, no. I'm a mythical character. Oh, a friend of Jim Farley's, eh? <laughs> I come down from the North Pole once a year to give things away. I give and give all up and down the land to make people happy. You do? Well, you'd better go back to the Pole, Fatty. But I'm Santa Claus. No, you're not. The government is Santa Claus today. And that was only last year, son. That's why my spirit's broken. Being Santa Claus is just one pain in the ermine after another. <laughs> well, won't you reconsider... Think how the headline will look in the paper. Santa Claus on sit-down strike. Well, Santa ain't a-getting up, son. This is one Christmas I'm going to enjoy in peace. What's that clock striking? Twelve o'clock, Santa. It's Christmas Day. It is, eh? Well, I ain't moving. I don't mean nothing to me. I'm sitting here. I'm taking it easy. I'm leaning right back here. Not getting kicked around this Christmas. Oh. Yes. Hey, Ma. Yes, Santa. Where's my mittens? My bag? My reindeer? My sleigh? You mean... Yep, I'm going, Ma. But I thought you said... I've changed my mind, son. Christmas ain't Christmas without Santa Claus. I'm a giving the world one more chance. So what about my story, Santa on sit-down? Change the headline, son. Just say, Buck Santa rides again. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Christmas will have come and gone. So right now, I want to wish every one of you the merriest and the happiest kind of a holiday. And that sincere wish comes from Portland and myself, Peter and Harry, and from our sponsors, the makers of Ipana Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica. And so then, from all of us to all of you, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Town Hall tonight, folks. Fun from Hollywood with our star comedian, Fred Allen. It's Town Hall tonight! <laughs> Listen to that crowd cheer as Fred Allen leads the parade to the old town hall. Fred's leading the band with the telescope, followed by those fallen stars of the stage, the mighty Allen art players. Let's join the happy throng, folks. Everybody's going. Everybody's going. 
I come slow. If you don't keep the audience in convulsions tonight, Seppo, you're fired. Don't worry, boss. I got a midget radio in my vest, and it's town hall tonight. That lady. How do you manage to stay so stout, Jolly Irene? I laugh and grow fat at my radio Wednesdays, Mr. Singling. It's town hall tonight. Human cannonball. Before we shoot you out of the cannon, Wizzo, have you anything to say? If I miss the net, take me to a hospital with a radio. It's town hall tonight. <laughs> in front of the old town hall, and there's Fred loading a hot water bottle in case folks get cold feet about going inside. Let's listen. Jack, be nimble. Jack, be quick. You better step on it, Jack, or you'll be late for services at the old town hall. Now, don't stampede there, neighbors. Evening, you... Mealy Mouth. Hi there, Mrs. Flood. Hi there, Brother Scale. How are things down at your fish market? Well, I'm selling plenty of fin, but no haddie. Well, that's life to a fish, all fin and no haddie. Folks, with a hey nonny nonny, and I may get funny on the inside. <laughs> on the inside, so hurry, hurry. Presenting that dull, doleful demon, drolling damp, daunty dilemma, dramatizing droll, dopey dumplings, delivering dunk devil McDaily, Dorchester's deadpan, Fred Allen in person. <laughs> What is that dead pan, Mr. Vonzell? I don't know the man who wrote it. Here. Oh, oh he did, hey? Yeah. You think I should have been buried from the neck up, in other words? <laughs> well, thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, before we close our fiscal year and help the last of the aging 1937 jokes to totter up here to the microphone, uh, say, Harry... I think before we start, you better look around the hall here. Well, have you lost something, Fred? No, but last Wednesday, you know, somebody left the door open, and that uh, gypsy monologist got in here, if you remember. Gypsy. Oh, Jack Benny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, now, wait a minute. Wait. Wait a minute, Harry. He isn't that funny. Oh, yeah. Did you hear Jack last Sunday? <laughs> no, no. I, uh, I sat by my radio all Saturday night to see if Toscanini was going to take an encore. <laughs> I was pretty tired. I slept all day Sunday. You mean you slept all through Jack's program? Why not? Why should I be the exception? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It was very funny, though. Oh, that's that only one man's opinion, yes. Mr. Von well, Zell. Know, but... Two men, yours and Mr. Ben. Yeah. <laughs> you know what he said? Jack said that you had a cheap microphone over here. Why, certainly. People don't get out their silver service when the riffraff comes to call, do they? <laughs> You're sure that he isn't here tonight? Yes, I'm positive, Fred. Then it looks like a great show. The curtain, Harry? Well, I'm ready to unfurl, Fred. And there's no unfurl like an old unfurl, Harry. Yes, the lights go out. And we bring you the latest news of the week. The town hall news sees nothing, shows all. New York City, New York. Christmas Day has come and gone, leaving in its wake thousands of disgruntled home folks who are dissatisfied with Christmas presents they receive. Many recipients of inappropriate gifts each year never have a chance to give vent to their feelings. Tonight, we afford several persons, double-crossed by Santa Claus, an opportunity to get even. We hope Santa is listening in. Town Hall News interviews the outstanding Yuletide Sawheads of 1937. First... Mr. Titus Filch, freelance, freelance kleptomaniac. Mr. Filch. Hiya, Bob. Hiya, Bunch. Hiya, all. Hiya. Hi. Uh, well, just, Hi. just a minute, Mr. Filch. Did you, uh, did you have a Merry Christmas? I ought to punch you right in the nose. Well, I, uh... Don't say Merry Christmas to me. Well, kleptomaniacs generally thrive at Christmas. What happened? Well, I'm in a department store doing my Christmas shop at the Uh-huh. I'm just snatching a piece of luggage when whammo. I feel something going down the back of me collar like a skyrocket. A cold chill? A cop's hand, Fred. A cop's hand, eh? Quick and you can say, Chris Kringle, I'm stooging for a judge. What did you get for Christmas? Ninety days. That's tough, all right. Yeah, I snag a Boston bag and they're sending me to Atlanta. They got no sense of direction. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Phillips. One of, one of, a sort of a verbal undertow as Mr. Filch left here. One of the bitterest Christmas casualties was Mr. Danforth Twaddle. Ah! You, uh, 
You are? You are mad, aren't you, Mr. Twaddle? I'm boiling, mister. I ought to wear a glass hat. I'm piking. Did you, uh... Did you get a raw deal? I'm so bind up, two of my toes are clinkers. Well, what induced it? <laughs> Mr. Uh... <laughs> Mr. Twaddle is being paid by the hour. We can't have him wait for that laugh at... <laughs> thing like that would run into money. Well, what induced this, uh, this, uh, impromptu tantrum, Mr. Twaddle? Nobody ever gives me nothing for Christmas, see? So I generally buy myself a couple of quarts of rum, see? I lock myself in and get plastered. See? <laughs> see? After two quarts, I'm cockeyed, brother. You miss Christmas entirely? Well, generally the firecrackers wake me up. Firecrackers on Christmas? What Christmas? I never come to till 4th of July. But what upset you so greatly this year? Well, nobody give me nothing this Christmas as usual. So I buys me annual two quarts of rum. A dame jostles me at the counter, our packages gets mixed up, and I walks out with the wrong bundle. What happened? I get up to me room, me tongue's hanging out, I open the bundle. Instead of the rum? I got two flannel step-ins and a girdle. A dilemma. <laughs> Aren't we all? And thank you, Mr. Twaddle. Still another ardent Yuletide hater is Miss Ophelia Rinko. Were you... Were you you disappointed in your present, Miss Rinko? A bachelor girl, 52, ain't interested in her present, mister. It's her future. You were upset this Christmas. I'm upset every Christmas. Why? Well, ever since I was a little girl... That's before your time. I can imagine. I can well imagine. I heard about Santa Claus coming down folks' chimneys. Well, you didn't take it seriously, did you? Not till I was 40. I was still an old maid, so I began to wonder if Santa Claus was single. Santa Claus was your last hope, huh? Every Christmas for the last 20 years, I've been dolling up, preparing midnight lunch for two, and sitting by the chimney all night, hoping... Have you any uh, message for your public? Yes, sir. Tell them up to now there ain't no Santa Claus. I'm sorry if there's anything I can... uh, Are you single, mister? Thank you, Miss Rinko. An unusual misunderstanding practically ruined Christmas for Mr. Dalrymple Offal. What marred the festive day for you, Mr. Offal? I'll never get over this Christmas, brother. What occurred? Well, you see, I'm contact man for the city garbage department. Contact man for the garbage department? Yeah, I stand in the wagon and contact the cans as the boys pass them up. <laughs> it's a, sort of a vice president in charge of residue. I see. You've got to be strong to hold a job like that. Strong ain't the word, brother. I'm... And that's putting it mildly, <laughs> Mr. Arthur. But uh, what spoils your Christmas? Well, like this, every night after work, you see, I drive home with three other guys, and it's a closed car. Have there... <laughs> Have there been any complaints? Well, nobody's come right out with it, but this year the boys pitched in and give me a bottle of something called, uh, Eau de Cologne. You mean Eau de Cologne? Yeah, it's French. I asked a guy who was selling Paris garters to translate it for me. Or did he? Yeah, he did. He he said, uh, Eau de Cologne was French for old Hennessy. French for old Hennessy, huh? And you drank it? In two gulps, brother. Have you noticed any distressing after effects? Well, I exhaled in a pool room today, and three guys tipped their hats. <laughs> no kidding. I don't know. Look, get a, get a load of this. Get a load of this. Delightful, and thank you, Mr. Offer. <laughs> Folks may rant and bewail their plights as each year ends, but time heals all wounds, and Christmas woes are soon forgotten as the new year approaches. Town Hall News brings you a candid camera shot of old man 1937 welcoming in his young successor, 1938. Well, 1938, I'm about finished. Yes, 1937, and a fine mess you've made of the world. Last year at this time, I was as cocky as you are, son. Well, I'll set things right in 1938. I wished I could stay and see you make the world happy and prosperous, son. Don't worry, I'll come through. I hope so. Uh, do you want to say a few words to the world tonight on my time? Sort of a preview? You bet. Well, go right ahead. Here, uh, watch my scythe. My touch foot there. Okay. Hello, folks. This is 1938. Let's go. Woo-hoo! <laughs> Thank you.
Now, we were supposed to bring you an innovation uh, in the line of quartets. Mr. Jerry Colonna and his swing jeers A quartet, but unfortunately, at a recital last evening, three members of the quartet were seriously injured. Mr. Colonna, the lead singer who had the presence of mind to duck during the verse, <laughs> is with us tonight. But since Mr. Colonna can only sing in quartet formation, Harry Von Zell, Peter Van Steeden, and I have agreed to make up his foursome. We haven't really had time to rehearse the number, ladies and gentlemen, but we're going to do the best we can. Now, what is your song, Mr. Colonna? When You Were Sweet Sixteen. When You Were Sweet Sixteen. All right. When you were sweet sixteen, how you used to look into my ruby lips, how you used to look into my eyes, how you used to look into my pockets. Ah, Jenny, do you remember when you were sixteen? You are too. You were sixteen from eighteen eighty to nineteen two. I remember when you gave me a cold watch, Bob, and told me to keep it forever. I've done exactly that, Jen. Well, not exactly. I haven't got the watch, Bob, but I always keep the pawn ticket close to my heart. I love you, as I love you, when you were as sweet, when you were as sweet, as you get at me. Thank you. That was one note I had left over, Mr. Colonna. I didn't want to have you go away without it. And now we have a special announcement, ladies and gentlemen. On Saturday, the town will salute Major Bowes back and see how he likes it. On Sunday... Mr. Allen! Mr. Allen! Quiet, please. If that's Snow White looking for the eighth dwarf, I'm... I'm not that small, except on the uh, latest popularity poll. Uh, hello. Well, sir, they laughed when I slipped the atlas into my back pocket. They didn't know I'd soon be sitting on top of the world. <laughs> if it isn't Portland. I'll say. Hello, Harry. Hello, Peter. Hello, Portland. Did you have a nice Christmas, Peter? Well, Portman. Did you get anything in your stocking? Not that I know of. Well, didn't you take it off and look to make sure? <laughs> I will later, Fred. I've been pretty busy. I know how it is, Pete. A man with a baton in his hand is always about to beat the band. <laughs> Did you get anything in your stocking, Mr. Allen? Uh, yes, I hung it too near the fireplace. When I when I put it back on, I got a hot foot. <laughs> what about you, Harry? Oh, well, I'm... Is something the matter, Harry? Oh, I'm all right, I guess. What do you mean, all right? You look as though somebody cut a hole in your bean bag. 
What's the matter if you're not happy here, Harry? Oh, no, I'm happy on this program, Fred. It's that other program. You mean Phil Baker's, Harry? Yeah. Last week, I had a terrible fight with that beetle. You know, that heckling ghost that haunts Phil's program? Oh, beetle, what did you do? Well, he slowly kicked me all over. I he showed did. beetle, though. I picked up my commercials and left. Well, it... It serves Phil Baker right. If he's letting a ghost run his program... No, look, it wasn't Phil's fault, Fred. Phil's a prince. In what country? <laughs> no, really, I mean, he's Phil's swell. It's that beetle. He... Well, what did Beetle say to you, Harry? Oh, every... He called me everything. He called Fred a bum. <gasps> he called you everything, but he still had that one word left over for me. <laughs> that beetle has a lot of nerve. Why, that broken-down echo? His voice sounds like a statue coughing. We ought to, why, he ought to stick his head in an electric fan and we'd have scrambled sawdust. Yeah, if you'd stick your jokes in an electric fan, we'd have scrambled eggs. Gosh, hey, what, what, what was that? Was that? That's hey, Beetle, who said Fred. that? Who's heckling? That's Beetle. He's followed me over here. Yeah, you bet it's Beetle, Von Zab. You thought you were rid of me, huh? <laughs> oh, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You E-flat phantom. <laughs> You're nothing but a loose voice. I'm apt to knock you back into a ventriloquist. Ah, quiet, long puss. I'll scoot up your pants leg and air condition your spine. <laughs> Why, you... You better cut it out, Mr. Beetle. Yes, you watch your step over here, Spook. Yeah, don't spook till you're spooking to, my <laughs> And quit telling those Phil Baker gags on this program, slowly. Why, for two pins, I'd lift up your shroud and paddle your ectoplasm. Ah, lay down, Alan. Here comes a pallbearer. You leave Mr. Allen alone, uh, Beetle. Ah, his radio audience is doing that. And you, Bonsell. Now, see here, Beetle, you can insult me all you want, but leave Fred out of this. Well, you two guys are friends of Baker's, aren't you? Baker hasn't got two friends. <laughs> and quit laughing on this program. Nobody's laughing at it. Somebody ought to laugh on it. If I get my hands on you, Zephyr, I'll twist you around until you feel as though you spent the night in a French horn. Oh, yeah? Why, you're nothing but a bag of wind without the bag. Peter, you, you, you tell him, Fred. You, 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 I'll tell him. <laughs> If I had if, if I had a vacuum cleaner here, Beetle, I'd siphon you up and get in the bag with your loan for about two minutes. Now you better go on back to Phil Baker, Beetle. Oh, trying to put a curse on me, eh? <laughs> now listen, Beetle. Enough is enough, as the cow said when the farmer went away and left the milking machine turned on. <laughs> You might be all right as a as a hostess in a cemetery. Yeah, well, I feel at home in here. <laughs> I'd like to be a banshee for only two seconds. Don't worry, Mr. Allen. I'll get rid of him. Oh, get rid of him how, Portland? Well, I've sent for somebody. He'll be here any minute. Yeah, well, I can lick my weight in wildcats. That has nothing to do with Fred and me, Beetle. Yeah, I said wildcats, not polecats. Oh, oh. <laughs> That's done it. Come on, Beetle. Borrow a body and come out and fight like a man. I dare you. Who's that? I think it's that party I sent for, Mr. Allen. Come in. Come in. Hey, who, who, did anybody come in? I didn't see anybody. I did. I told you I sent for somebody to get rid of Beetle. Well, who's your friend, Portland? The Invisible Man. Are you there, Frank? Standing by, buddy. Hey, get that bum out of here. <laughs> Oh, boy. Say, that invisible man will take care of you, Beetle. Yeah, you'll pay for this, Marcel. Quiet, Breeze. You better blow. <laughs> nice work, friend. Where are you? Right here on the chandelier. What's been going on? Beetle's been bakering our program, Frank. Oh, he has, hey? Now, listen, you. Ah, yeah, take it easy, you'll win. Quiet, quiet, Gus. You may have come in like a blast, but you're going out like a puff. Take this. <laughs> Did you hit him in Vizzy? And how? A stiff uppercut to the halo. Watch this. Oh, 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 hey, where is that guy? Oh, why, you ectoplasmic punk? Oh, 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 hell, murder, hell, hey, Baker, Baker. Oh. Have you had enough, Beetle? Oh, yeah. I'm going back to Phil Baker. I can handle him. So long. Oh, say, what happened in Vizzy? I fixed Beetle. 
bringing up my favorite program. Hey, thanks a lot, Frank. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Yeah, no trouble, folks. Could I shake your hand, friend? You are shaking it, Alan. <laughs> oh, I, I thought my thumb was in a draft. <laughs> well, I'll wheeze along, folks. Goodbye. Oh, so long. So long, folks. Say, he's a nice guy when you get to know him. Sure is. He sure did us a big favor, you know that? That's the end of Beetle on this program. You think he'll bother us again, Mr. Allen? Well, how can he? We'll all, we're all going back to New York tomorrow. We'll be on the train before he even comes to again. Gosh, just think. Next Wednesday, we'll be back in Radio City. Gee, it's a small world, all right, isn't it? You wouldn't think it was so small if you paid for the railroad ticket. <laughs> I'm all packed. My trunk's Oh, it's Hallie Hose. Yeah, I'm packed, too. My Ipana, Salopatica, my double-duty toothbrush. Are you packed, Mr. Allen? Yep. Yeah, as soon as I shut my mouth, I'm ready to leave. Come in. Mr. Allen? Yeah? Is your t- town hall company leaving for New York tomorrow? Yes. Why? I'm the engineer on the chief. Will this whistle on the engine be all right? That'll be fine. Thank you. <laughs> Well, guess we're all set, Fred. Yes, Harry. How about you, Portland? Have you any last words you'd like to say to California? Yep. Tally ho! And now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the Mighty Allen Art Players. The dessert of our evening's entertainment, if you like camembert. Tonight, they steal away from their artistic mouse traps to present a mystery melodrama of Hollywood society entitled The Great Swimming Pool Mystery, or He Didn't Know His Own Backyard from a Hole in the Ground. Over to your Peter. Hello? Bungle Detective Agency? Yes, Inspector Bungle's here, but I think he's grilling. I'll see. Uh, Inspector Bungle? Just a minute, Miss Clue. I gotta finish this third degree. So you won't talk, eh? You talk. You ain't pulling no fast one on Inspector Bungo. Are you gonna talk? Well. It's no use. He won't talk. What are you gonna do? I'm getting another parrot. <laughs> Send this one back to the pet shop. Yes, sir. Will you answer the phone? Oh, yeah. The phone. The phone. Where is it? What a detective. Can't even find your own telephone. Now, don't tell me. Hang up the receiver. Wait till it rings again and I get a clue. I'll show you who can find a phone. Okay. That's all I wanted to know. I'll swoop down on her now. Where did that ring come from? Now, don't tell me. Ah, uh, here's the phone. Nothing's escaping Bungo. Well, now that you've found it, answer it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello? Inspector Bungo speaking. Yes, J. Edgar. I closed that case last week. That man Garner ain't missing. He's vice president. Okay. Did you take care of that other case? I sent the brewery a check today. Now, where's my... Where's my bloodhound, Muldoon? Your dog was in this morning and he went out again. On business or pleasure? I wouldn't know. That bloodhound's the smartest detective in the game, Miss Clue. Since I learned to speak dog, Muldoon can come in the office here, bark out a report, and I can take it down for beta. Miss Muldoon now, open that door. What's he saying now? He's got hot news, Miss Clue. About the Bailey kidnapping. Oh, 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 now, keep your leash on, Muldoon. I'll be with you in a minute. Oh, 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 what did he say? He says it's okay. He's in no hurry. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> Get ready for some notes on the Bailey kidnapping, Miss Clue. I'm going to talk to Muldoon here in dog. <laughs> he did, hey? <laughs> Why the double cross and rat? Did Muldoon catch the kidnappers? Yeah, it was old Bailey himself. He dressed up as Santa Claus and put the kid in his bag. Now, here's what you do, Muldoon. Okay. Work along them lines. He'll have Bailey back here in 20 minutes. Where's my sun lamp? I'm going to shadow myself around the office to keep in practice. <laughs> Your sun lamp's in eclipse. The installment collector was here this morning. Oh, yeah? They ain't pulling no fast one on Inspector Bungo. Turn on me confidential police radio. Yes, sir. Calling Inspector Bungo. Calling Inspector Bungo. Okay, okay, I'm here. Why don't you say so, dope? <laughs> now, don't get personal. Give me that confidential police call. Okay. Calling Inspector Bungo. 
Swimming pool stolen in Hollywood Mansion at 709 North Cannon Drive. Reported once. Swimming pool stolen. Calling Inspector Bungo. Shut that off, Miss Clue. Okay. Where's my police siren? Here it is. Sakes alive, what's that? It's a police siren. All I gotta do is get in a taxi and keep blowing this. And I got my own police car. There's a swimming pool stolen on North Cannon Drive. Inspector Bungle never fails, Miss Clue. I'm off! Is this 709 North Cannon Drive? I see. Who are you, Bounder? What's the route? I'm Inspector Bungle, bud. Is your swimming pool missing? Oh, yes. Our pool's been stolen. I'm frantic. Don't give me no phony name, bud. <laughs> You ain't frantic. Come clean. Nobody's kidding, Inspector Bungle. What's your moniker? Moniker? I say. Your handle, your name. Don't come to fast and loose on Bungle. I'm Hortry Scriven, the British author. Mrs. Scriven and I leased this house this morning. With a swimming pool? Rather a beauty. But it's gone. Vanished. Where was it? Come in here. I'll show you. This room is empty, Scriven. Yes, the pool was in the yard, right under this open window. When did you first miss it? My wife dove into it this morning, and by George, it wasn't there. I'll take a peek out this window. Stand back, Scriven. Is that your wife with her head stuck in the ground? Rather. We gotta get her out, bud. But I say she's only the missus. There's no hurry. But she might have a clue. Let's go out in the yard. <laughs> Expect a bungle on the job, lady. Grab her other leg, bud. Her limb, dear boy. Twig is the word, bud. <laughs> Grab it. We'll pull her out. <laughs> Steady, lady. <laughs> There we are, lady. Oh, 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 thank you. I say, Luella, look at your face. What a mud pack. Where am I? What happened? I'll do the grilling, lady. Where's your clothes? Why, this is my bathing suit. You should have worn the label. <laughs> but really, Luella's gear has nothing to do with our missing pool. You're right, bud. The pool was right here, hey? I saw it distinctly. Oh, definitely. I opened the window for Luella to dive. Didn't you look around when you didn't hear no splash? I may have other feelings, dear boy, but I'm not curious. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty state of affairs when one's swimming pool is stolen from under one's dive. Now, wait a minute. There's something else missing here. What? The hole in the ground. If somebody swiped your swimming pool, where's the hole in the ground? <laughs> You can search me. I'll frisk you later, bud. First, I'm searching the house. Open that door. But I say, the thief would scarcely hide the pool indoors, would he? A guy with a hot swimming pool will take chances, bud. Hotry will show you round, Mr. Bugle. Bungle's the name, lady. Regardless, I'm putting on my robe. You better call the real estate agent who rented you this house, sis. Get that guy here for a grilling. Right here. Tata. Hip hip. Simone, Simone. <laughs> And now, Hawtrey? I say Hawtrey's the cognomen. Okay, regardless, I'm looking over the house. Nobody's hiding no swimming pool on Inspector Bungle. What's this next room here? Now, this is the bar and cocktail room. This here is the billiard room. And this is the card room. This is the rumpus room. Here's the living room, dining room, breakfast room, sitting room, bedroom, and bar. That's two baths, eh? <laughs> right ho have you got a clue? Not yet. The missing swimming pool ain't in any of them rooms. What's that bell? Come clean, Scriven. You ain't pulling no fast one on Inspector Bungle. I say keep your dicky on, Bungle. It's the door. This may be the guilty party. Do it off! Yes, Hawtrey, I'll open the door. Don't! Don't open that door till I get me gun out, lady. Well, I'll tell you. Did you get it out? All but one bullet, yeah. <laughs> okay, open the door. I should say so. Oh, come in, Mr. Escrow. Thank you, Mrs. Scriven. Uh, what did you call me about? Where was you on the night of December 25th, bud? Answer yes or no. No. A cutie, hey? <laughs> uh, who is this imbecile, Mrs. Scriven? Oh, he's Inspector Bagel or something. Bungle lady. I should say so. Is something wrong, Mrs. Scriven? Don't get personal, bud. What's your game? This is Mr. Escrow, our real estate agent, Inspector. Come clean, Escrow. Where's that missing swimming pool? What swimming pool? 
our swimming pool's been stolen, Mr. Escrow. What? Yes. That beautiful swimming pool gone? Vanished. Why, you were paid for this swimming. But surely you don't think that I would pilfer a beastly dunking device? All I know is I rented you a house with a swimming pool this morning, didn't I? There was a pool in the rear yard, yes. Can't you do something, Mr. Jungle? Fungo, lady. Fungo, as in mess about. My, if you're a detective, I'm a nonogenarian. Meat eating's got nothing to do with a swimming pool, but neither of you, stupid. My pool is gone, and I demand ten thousand dollars damages. Not too fast, Escrow. Fungal is solving his case. Now you've seen the swimming pool through this window, hey, Mister Scribbin? Oh, definitely. And I came in, opened the window, and dove out. That's all I wanted to know, folks. The mystery solved. What? Solved nothing. I demand $10,000. Quiet, swindler. I'm closing this window. Now look. By you. Our swimming swimming pool. pool. Right. It's painted on the window. Painted on the window? Stordra. Definitely lifelike. (laughs) Come clean, Escrow. Okay, Bungle. You've caught me with the window down. What's the big idea, trying to swindle these people? I had to do it, Bungle. You can't rent a house in Hollywood without a swimming pool. You're right, Blood. All the movie people have got swimming pools on their minds. And that's why I'm letting you go, Blood. It ain't no crime to swindle people who got water on the brain. <laughs> To all of your friends, both old and new, we send our sincere greetings. May you begin and end this new year in health, happiness, and prosperity. And don't forget, we invite you to be with us again next Wednesday night. Good night. Heard on tonight's program. An hour of trials in town hall tonight, folks. Fun with our star comedian, Fred Allen. It's town hall tonight. Listen to that crowd cheer Fred Allen as he heads his weekly parade to the old town hall. They're beating the band with a fresh stick, followed by those drums of the sea, the mighty Allen R. players. Let's join that happy song. Everybody going! Everybody going! Here they come, home folks. Are you going crazy cutting that telephone wire, Gerald? Nobody's bothering me while I'm listening to the radio. It's town hall tonight. Society hostesses. Are we having entertainment after dinner, Mrs. Van Clay? We well, certainly are. The butler is turning on the radio. It's town hall tonight. <laughs> Tavern customers. Hey, waiter, how about a little service? I'll be with you when this radio program's over, brother. It's Town Hall tonight. Well, here we are inside the old town hall. Presenting that wild woolly werewolf, wobbling, warmed over wheezes, winning in weak water's whimsy, wailing wacky windy witticism, Wagner's race through Westchester's weary willy, Fred Allen in person. <laughs> <laughs> and good evening, ladies. I was looking for him. It finally dawned on me it was I. Uh, thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, in case you haven't looked at the calendar lately, it's Wednesday again. And if any of you folks at home have dozed off by the radio, we're not going to take any chances. Now, we're going to shoot off a gun here in the studio to make sure everyone's awake at home for our session tonight at the Old Town Hall. All right, Ted. Well, now that we're all bright and chipper, <laughs> we'll start the ball rolling with the... With the get back up on the chairs, folks, if anyone was blown off there. We'll start the ball rolling with the Town Hall News. Did Harry show you how to work the curtain, Andre? You bet. It's coming right down, Chris. The lights go out. And we bring you the latest news of the week. The town hall news sees nothing, shows less. New York City, New York. The district attorney in a recent speech at the Legal Aid Society dinner suggested a plan to provide penniless offenders with better legal counsel. The district attorney says 
that the fee gouging shyster who takes advantage of predicaments of his unfortunate clients has got to go. Town Hall News subscribes to District Attorney's attitude and shows the hapless plight of a minor lawbreaker who fell into the clutches of an unscrupulous barrister. The prisoner, one Galahad Dub... The character Galahad Dub is purely fictional, ladies and gentlemen, and any similarity to any living person is purely coincidental. The unscrupulous barrister, one renegade thought... Character renegade thought is a figment of Mr. Allen's imagination, ladies and gentlemen, and any similarity to any practicing barrister is purely one of those things. <laughs> the trial, the people of New York versus Galahad Dove. The following trial, ladies and gentlemen, is purely imaginary. And any similarity to any trial ever held or any legal action ever taken in New York or any other state is so much hug a mother if you get what I mean. <laughs> And now that the town hall news status is established beyond a doubt, we proceed. This document showing one luckless victim's experience with a gouging lawyer is called the same case of Galahad Dove. On the morning of March 1st, 1937, 1934 rather, Galahad Dove, a whisk room designer, walking down Broadway, sat his gum out on the sidewalk. The dull, sticky thud of gum had scarcely died away when Galahad Dub heard the voice of the law. Hey, you. Pardon me, officer? Yes, you. What's the big idea of spitting that gum on the sidewalk? Well, I can uh, no sick English. Sir. Oh, Jimmy, that. You're under arrest. Yes, Galahad Dub was arrested, fingerprinted, and rushed pell-mell away to spend the night in jail. The following morning, he was arraigned in court. Galahad Dub. Uh, present, Sir Honor. You're charged here with expectorating a mass of tenacious substance commonly used as a masticatory on a sidewalk in New York City. This is a violation of a city ordinance, guilty or not guilty. Well, I don't know, Chuck. I ain't got no lawyer. The court will appoint a lawyer to defend you. A renegade court. Okay, Judge, I'll take the case. Ah, the unscrupulous attorney is appointed. Galahad Dub is returned to jail. Late that afternoon, renegade taught that wolf in shyster's clothing calls to see his victim. Hello, Tom. Oh, uh, hey, I've got to get out of here, Mr. Court. You're going out of here flying, Tom. Good. Uh, what are you going to do? How much do you got on you? Uh, ten bucks. Well, fork it over. i got to start things coming. The whole three bucks? Well, sure. I'm getting you a habeas corpus at three bucks. And I'll pass that two more. A heavy scope of just two bucks and an off left you. Well, that's only five. Well, I gotta get your witness, ain't I? Well, how much is your witness? Well, I could get you one for three bucks. But if you want a witness that speaks English, that'll be five bucks even. Well, okay. Here's the ten. Right. You're going out of here flying. Hey, hey, what about my case? Oh, yeah, I forgot. What'd you do? I spit my come out on the sidewalk. Ah, think. You're going out of here flying. But did our hero go out of that jail flying? No, 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 dear friends. No. Galahad Dub was in the clutches of an unscrupulous lawyer. The next morning, his case came up in court again. Galahad Dub, have present test. My client ain't guilty, Your Honor. I got a witness right here. Your name, madam? Millie Twerp. <laughs> Millie Twerp? Did you see the defendant, Galahad Dub, uh, expectorate his chewing gum on the sidewalk as charged? Well, I didn't see him spit out the gum, Judge, but I stepped in it and sprained the ankle. I missed two shows. Two shows? You're an actress? Yeah, I'm hostess at the flea circus. I'm suing this bum for 500 bucks in medical expenses. Suing me for 500 dollars, Judge. You are now the defendant in a joint suit. 500 bucks, all I did Leave was... it to me, Dub. I'm demanding a new trial. You're going out of here flying. <laughs> And Galahad Dub did go out flying, right back to the city jail. And back came his unscrupulous attorney, renegade Torf, to gouge him. Well, double boy. Yeah, I gotta have more money. Uh, how much you got? I got two hundred dollars in the bank. Good, write me out a check. You're going out of here flying. Yeah? Yeah. I'm swearing you out of written flake Randy Mephisto. Uh, take a spine and... Yeah, that dame with a strained angle double crossed you, Dub. I gotta get a new witness. Can you get another witness? Say, for 200 bucks, I can get a perjurer. You're going out of here, flyer. Ah, uh, but six months later, we still find Galahad Dub in court. His gouging attorney, renegade court, is still with him. The trial opens. Galahad Dub? I'm 
So fresh, Chuck. And he's still not guilty, Chuck. Not guilty in the damage suit or the gum littering, Chuck. Not guilty across the board, Judge. That's a lie, Judge. I can swear he popped out the gun. Her testimony the shambles a lie, Judge. Oh, you shake Go on, I'll slap you with a subpoena. Order, order, order in the court. Now, what have you got to say, court? I got a new witness, Judge. Shut up, stranger. Okay. Hector Shuffle? Yeah, I'm a picket, Judge. I was picket in a Frankfurt stand on Broadway. The Frankfurt's is union. I was picket in the mustard. <laughs> Yes, yes, go on. Well, I stepped on the gum and my foot got stuck to the pavement. A walking delegate from the union come by and seen I wasn't walking up and down, so I lost my job, Pickerton. Do you swear that Millie Quirk didn't step on the gum? No, no, it was me. I got stuck on it, Judge. I lost my job. My wife heard about it and jumped out a window and was killed. I'm charging this guy with murder. I I, I couldn't do nothing. Quiet, quiet, Duff. You are now the defendant in three suits. Expectorating your gum, yeah. damages, yeah. and murder. Murder? I only spit out my gum. Keep your shirt on, sir. You're going out of here flying. But did he? No. Back when Galahad dubbed to jail to await his trial for murder. The Navy barrister... <laughs> the Navy barrister, renegade thought, again is found in the cell with his... With his bewildered client. Mine is a tough rap to beat, Doug. Yeah, but all I did was set out my gum. Why couldn't I please you? What, and get a fine? Where would I come in? I gotta get mine, ain't I? Yeah, now I'm up for more. Ah, I'll beat this case, Doug. They ain't pulling no fast one on Renegade Talk. Good for me. <laughs> what do I do now? You got any more dough? Well, I got less than my insurance policy, but I got some fuck. It's right here. Okay, sign it, Doug. All right, here you are. Uh, uh, this makes you my beneficiary. Right, now we're getting someplace. You're going out of here flying. And after three years in jail, we find our hero, Galahad Dub, again in court. And again, his faithless attorney... <laughs> his faithless attorney, renegade court, has the case in hand. The people versus Galahad Dub. The charge is murder. Hey, look, Judge, all I My client's was... innocent, Judge. It has been proven that as a result of Galahad uh, voiding his gum on a public thoroughfare, Hector Shuffle lost his job as a picket, and Mrs. Shuffle became mentally deranged and took a dry dive out of her third-story window. <laughs> the court hereby finds the defendant, Galahad Dub, guilty of murder. What's the sentence, Judge? Yeah? You have a choice on this verdict. Your client can either have the chair or life in prison. Well, I- I'll take life. Hold it, Dub. We'll take the chair, Judge. What? Very well. Galahad, Dub. Yeah, yeah. The court hereby sentences you to die in the electric chair. Uh, Congratulations, Dub. We put it over. But you kept saying, Dub, you're going out of here flying. Oh, my mistake, Dub. You're going out of here flying. Oh. <laughs> Thus ends the strange, strange case of Galahad, Dub who was gouged into Wingdom Come. <laughs> By that nefarious barrister, Renegade Thought. The moral, ladies and gentlemen, spitting out your gum on the street is like giving your case to an unreliable attorney. You're sure to get stuck in the end. <laughs> Van Steeden and the Arpana Troubadours had just played Great Day. Peter was a little pressed for time, so he couldn't give us all of Great Day. Just a dash of the forenoon, as it were. <laughs> now, on Friday night... Yes, sir, uh, Alan! Oh. Yes, sir, Alan! Now, no, they're, they're not here, neither of them. The boys have gone. They went that way. <laughs> uh, hello! <laughs> well, sir... They Gosh, look. the studio seems kind of empty without Harry. Oh, I wouldn't say Mr. Von Zell was that fat, Portland. <laughs> Who's taking Harry's place? Oh, sir, that's right. You haven't met our new announcer. Uh-huh. I'll introduce you. Oh, Andre. Yes, Fred. Portland, this is Harry's understudy, Andre Baruch. Well, this is indeed a pleasure, Portland. Thank you. Have you met Peter Van Steeden, Mr. Baruch? No, I haven't. Peter? Yes, Portland. This is 
with our new announcer, Mr. Andre Baruch. Glad to know you, Andre. The pleasure's all mine, Mr. Van Steeden. Oh, just call me Happy Andre. And any time you want to laugh, <laughs> just let me know. Peter, some comedian, Mr. Baruch. Oh, really? I thought you conducted the orchestra, Happy. I don't know where people get that impression, Andre. Music's just a sideline with me now. I do most of the comedy on the program. <laughs> do most of the comedy, hey? With your back to the audience there? What do you do if you mug? Dislocate your neck? <laughs> the only confidential mugger on radio. <laughs> Say, you do all of the comedy. Somebody ought to give you to a Mickey Finn. <laughs> There's a little jealousy on the program, Andre. Uh, certain parties. Yes, Peter doesn't want to mention any names, Mr. Baruch. But it's Mr. Allen. Oh, it's a... Uh, I should be jealous of a musician who thinks four in the bar is a quartet drinking. <laughs> Don't believe all you hear on this program, Andre. Now listen, Satchmouth Van Steeden. <laughs> the stork must have brought you on a rainy night and you've been all wet ever since. <laughs> have I got an answer for that? What is it, Peter? Oh, I'm no show-off. I can hold it. <laughs> You know what retarding an egg does to a hen, I suppose. <laughs> Don't lift to that old acid puss, Andre. Acid puss? Now look, nozzlehead. <laughs> if you had some sawdust on that pan of yours, I couldn't tell it from the face on the barroom floor. <laughs> Have I got an answer for that? Uh, what is it, Peter? Oh, it's a dandy, but I'm still holding in. <laughs> inside, Peter. If his inside knows what his outside looks like, he certainly is. <laughs> Quiet, dudes. I've got to ask Andre a question. Yeah. Yes, Happy? How are you on laughing for my joke? Uh, why don't you tell Mr. Baruch one, Peter, and find out? That's an idea. I will. Let's go, Peter. What's your joke? Did you hear what Jack Benny is naming his new racehorse, Andre? No. What is Jack Benny naming his new racehorse, Happy? N.B.C. Biscuit. <laughs> N.B.C. Biscuit. Okay, Andre, you'll do. Now, look. <laughs> he certainly will do if he can laugh like that at nothing. <laughs> now, look. People who have seen Benny riding his horse around Hollywood tell me that when Benny's on the horse, you can't tell where the horse leaves off and Benny starts. <laughs> Come in. Telegram for Mr. Allen. Oh, thank you, boy. Uh, aren't you going to wait for a tip, boy? That's Allen, ain't it? Uh-huh. So long. <laughs> Why, that uniform squirt. Why, I should have snapped his bicycle clips for him. I, <laughs> if I was reaching down, I'd have done it, too. Uh, who's the telegram from, Mr. Allen? Here, I'm too upset. You were. You read it. Say, what do you know? It's from Harry Von Zell. What does Harry say, Portland? Dear Fred, I am up in the thick of the woods. Just heard the first part of your program. Wish you were here. Why? <laughs> Why, that ingrate, that overstuffed loafer. I'll and how I'll. Yes, yes, that's just saved by a knock on the door. I was to have told him. Come right in, Gramps. Yeah, hold on. Wait till I get my gear. Now, just a minute, you two. Yes, Ron? Yeah? Just let me press what's hanging out of your sleeve. This, uh, fringe? Know your hand, brother. You are now in conference with Baxter B. Blur, the world's greatest showman and town scout. Well, I, That's uh... what you say, brother. Well, I didn't, uh... I got a tip Harry Von Zell was off your program. Yeah? Uh, how did you, you know? Coming downtown, people was throwing their radios out the window. Coming down. You didn't go uptown, did you? See how it was going? See, uh, tell him who I am, Baxter. Why do I schmooze him once over lightly, Grant? Now, wait a minute. None of that. While Von Zell's away, you're gonna need plenty of talent on this program, Alan. Uh, tell him who I am, Baxter. I'll bite. Who are you? I'm Red Hot Grant. <laughs> They call me the Toscanini of the odds and ends. Toscanini. Yep. The... Grant can get music out of anything, Alan. Lord, yes. I can play on anything from a matchbox to a toy balloon. <laughs> Grant's a virtuoso on debris, Alan. 
He can play a tune on an ash barrel. Now, look, I have no... Tell him what I did in Bellows Falls. <laughs> in Be What did you do in Bellows Falls? The woodpeckers brought the theater back so Grant could give her a sidle. They brought the theater back. Yes, yeah, sure, you bet. Tell him what I did at Biddeford Mean. Grant played a bowling alley at Biddeford and stood him up. <laughs> I haven't got time to talk to Pin Boy. Grant holds the audition record for 1937, brother. Oh, yes, I played for Major Bowles, got insulted, was packed up and out of the hall in four minutes flat. <laughs> But you... No buts. Let it go, Graham. Yes, sir. Uh, my first number, I'm playing on an ordinary paper of matches. Hey, you can't get music out of those matches. I can't. Hey, listen to this. Ready with your accordion, Doctor? Okay. Hit it, son. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, such <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. how's that, lame brain? You know I can't answer that question truthfully over the air. But, jiggity, I'm a homeboy at heart, but I sure went to town. Fine. Now, if you'll just pick up that musical cutlery there. Hey, you ain't heading off Grant till he gets to his big finale, bud. You bet. I'm winding up with his toy balloon. Wait till I blow her up. I don't know what it is. I pet babies. I don't pick flowers. I give folks in wheelchairs the right of way. And everything happens to me. <laughs> Quiet, bud. Gramps all set for his balloon solo. Okey bokey, let it go, Professor. <laughs> What was that, a quarter note backfired? My Gramps' balloon buster. It's okey boke I can still play it. Well, don't tell me you've got another balloon. No, sir, I'm making a little balloon out of the big one that just broke. Yeah, you can't stop Gramps, Bob. So I've discovered. Let her go, boys. <laughs> what did you do? You, did you blow a filling there at the end? Yeah, that was, uh, how'd you like that? Uh, is that the end? That is the grand finale, brother. Fine. Well, what do you got to say? Am I getting Harry Von Jill's job? It's up to Portland. What do you say, Portland? Hallie? Hello? I tell me, whoever put me sleep to sleep should have awakened me there when they finished. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Peter Van Steeden, the Ipana Troubadours, the Town Hall Quartet, and I have just finished for you, You Couldn't Be Cuter. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the mighty Alan R. Clare. Tonight, they offer a tribute to a popular radio comedian and present a musical tableau called This is the House that Jack Built. Over to you, Peter. <laughs> Every Sunday night during the past few months, radio listeners have been hearing about the house Jack Benny is building in Beverly Hills. We all know of the alleged progress that builders and termites have made. And between Jell-O commercials, Mr. Benny has boasted, with his California sun-kissed ego, that he and his violin will occupy their new home, as the escrow flies, on May 18, 1938. Ah, but will it? Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you a cavalcade showing that down through the ages the Bennies have been building houses they have never lived in, proving that a Benny has yet to cross the threshold of a dwelling and say to himself, this is home sweet home. <laughs> The first Benny missed living in his own home in 200,000 B.C. He was a prehistoric ne'er-do-well. Gog Benny, a stone cutter. Gog lived in a swamp and his days were spent chiseling words on rocks. For he was a Stone Age author whose light fiction even weighed 80 or 90 tons. On one morning, Gog Benny was chipping away at a rock. A stranger stopped and spoke to him. Uh, you got Benny, uh, busy writing sonnet. Uh, me from Stone Age Real Estate Corporation. You ought a company build you cave, cave finished. How much? One brontosaurus thus down, one leopard tooth a week. Too much. Offer half. Stone Age Real Estate Corporation, one price company. Dog Benny, one price two. Offer half. Deal off. Ha. Ah. Dog Benny stay in swamp. Spend life cutting stones. God, Benny will die as he lives. A chiseler. <laughs> 
Yes, the first Benny was a chiseler. And his possum only kept him from moving into the cave he had ordered built by the Stone Age Real Estate Corporation. But the world spun on its dizzy way, and the next Benny to defile the pages of history turned up in the 12th century. Stradivarius Benny, a wandering violin player, ordered a house to be built in the little village of Pisa in Italy. The house was finally completed, and Michelangelo, the architect, called for Stradivarius Benny to show him his new home. The two men were walking along the Plaza del Broccoli. Stradivarius Benny spoke. We have walked a great distance, Michelangelo. Your house, she's just around this corner, Signor Stradivarius. Uh, where? Uh, take a look, please, across the plaza. He can't. That's not a house. It's a tower. She's like a lighthouse, around and high. Well, uh, why did you build me this fancy chimney? Because the Signor Benny is a cheap. I'm going to need 2,000 lira for bricks, and you give me 50. I'm going to need 1,000 lira for shingles, you give me 15. I'm going to need a 300 lira for cement. Senior Stradivari puts Benny. He's giving me nothing. What I can build, I'm going to build. It's a power. <laughs> well, the uh, price is right. I'll make it do. Yeah, take a look inside. I'm going to open the door. Go in. All right. I just... Oh, oh, help, help. That's the matter for you. Uh, I just stepped inside the door and the whole tower tipped to the side. Uh, yes, I know. Senior is too cheap to buy cement. Look, the whole tower is leaning. That's just what I'm expecting. What have you used for the foundation? What I'm mean, used? Jello. <laughs> and today, ladies and gentlemen, the house that was never lived in by Stradivarius Benny still has its jello foundation, and it is called the Leaning Tower of Pisa. For three centuries, nothing is known of the Bennies. But in 1645 A.D., in the tiny town of Cuchentillach, in, in Scotland, one Jock McBenny, a bagpipe teacher, started to build his own shanty. He was almost finished. On the last day, he was hammering away. Well, good morrow to you, Jock McBenny. Aye, good day to you, Mrs. McFeckle. It's a bonny roof you're building. Aye, it's bonny. What are those two big holes in the roof? One hole is the bathroom. When it rains, it's a shower bath. Aye, but other hole? That's the night reading room. I can read by the light of the moon. Now, who shall be finished tomorrow? Good. The whole village will be here for the hoosewarman, Jock. Hoosewarman? I can build my own fires, Mrs. McFeckle. A hoosewarman is a celebration, Jock. Celebration? Aye. When a hoose is finished, folks gather from miles around to eat, drink, and be merry. At whose expense? At yours, Jack McBenny. They eat my haggis and drink my spirits? Aye, the minute your hoose is finished. Then the hoose of Jack McBenny will never be finished, Mrs. McFackle. But, Jack, the champion tightwad of Scotland gave a hoose waterman. Then take a look at the new champion, Mrs. McFackle. It's Jack McBenny! <laughs> Jock McBenny held the Teeth Ward Championship until his being day. To save the price of a hoose warming, he never moved into his hoose. Early in the 18th century, colonists started flocking to America, and in 1733, a Benny suddenly appeared as if by magic in Philadelphia. He was Truman Benny, a chime salesman, who was later to sell a cracked bell to the city. <laughs> Truman and his wife, Faith Livingston, live and died in Philadelphia. They begat many little Bennies who overran the city. And finally, the state in which Philadelphia found itself was called Bennysylvania. <laughs> in 1849, the gold rush started, and a cross eyed Benny, one snag tooth, got off the California Trail and ended up with his covered wagon at Waukegan, Illinois. Waukegan was a rip-snorting trading post. The pit survived. Dog ate dog and vice versa. And the villagers... The villagers were so... <laughs> the villagers were so tough, the babies were teased on each other. Snagtooth Benny decided to settle down in Waukegan. He paid a formal visit to the mayor. Where's the mayor of Waukegan? I'm the mayor, stranger. Who gun talk, it's the name. 
I'm Snag Tooth Benny. I'm aiming to settle here in Waukegan. And it's got to be pretty tough to reside here, partner. Well, I'm so tough, I got my boots laced with rattlesnakes. The buttons on my coat is black widow spiders. And I got a wildcat outside watching my duffel bag. A boy scout, eh? <laughs> That's right. I'm aiming to get me a cabin here in Waukegan. Jesse James was telling me that none of you Bennies ever get to live in your own houses. Well, Snag Tooth Benny is the fire in that tradition. I'm getting into my own shebang. Well, come on. I'll get your cabin next door. Let's go. Yes, sir. Cabins is mighty scarce here in Waukegan. This shebang next door empty? Nope. There's a couple living here. I'll see if they're in the hunt. But do you think they'll vacate? I'll show you how we take care of the housing problem here in Waukegan. Howdy, Mayor Joker. Howdy, Mrs. Rumpel. Where's your meat? Mutsy is peeling a puma. <laughs> Say, uh, Mutsy. Yeah? Two gun poker to see you. Yeah, well, what's on your mind, two gun? As Mayor Waukegan, I'm a renting this cabin to Snag Tooth Benny. But we're living here, Mayor. Hey, oh, yeah, you ain't putting me and Mrs. Rumpus out without a dispossessed. Here's your dispossessed, Musty. So, and here's your young Mrs. Musty. Oh. And there's your cabin, Snag Tooth. Thank you, Mayor Talcott. I appreciate your hospitality here, but I ain't so keen on your manners. What's wrong with Walt Egan's manners, Snag Tooth? You shouldn't have plugged the man to start two gun where I come from. It's ladies first. Them's fighting words, Snag Tooth. And I'm a... Oh, you're a dead Benny. Jesse James was right. A Benny never gets to live in his own house. <laughs> And so the first Benny to come to Waukegan left in spirit without setting material foot inside of his house. Other Bennies came to Waukegan later, but they lived in parking spaces and formed little communities in pool rooms behind the eight ball. <laughs> in 1902, a J. Hamilton Benny went into politics. He ran for representative. All Waukegan was in the taxidermist that night to hear the election result. Well, do you think you'll get in, J. Hamilton Benny? Anything short of unanimous will be a blow. Quiet, here come the election returns on the radio. Cheerio, this is Bill Jefferson bringing you the final election return. Patrick Henry, 11,671 votes. J. Hamilton Benny, 7. Henry Clay Lemke, 1. J. Hamilton Benny decisively defeated for representative. Cheerio. Oh, too bad, Jay Hamilton Benny. Oh, shame, Mr. Benny. Ah, it's that fatal Benny curse. I should have run for the Senate. Why couldn't you be a representative, Jay Hamilton? No Benny yet has been able to get into the House. <laughs> Jay Hamilton Benny, a politician, told the truth. No Benny yet has ever gotten into the House. And today, May 18th, 1938 A.D., Jack Benny was supposed to move into his new house. We bring you a last-minute flash from Beverly Hills, showing exactly just what happened a few minutes ago. Jack and Mary approached the house with the builder. The builder said, Well, Mr. Benny, here's your house all finished. Isn't it beautiful, Jack? Yeah, it sure is. Let's look inside. I'll open the door. Oh, you can't open the door, Mr. Benny. Why not? There's no door now. Well, get one. That's two dollars. Two dollars? Come on, Mary. Oh, aren't we going to into our new house, Jack? No, we're going back where we came from. Two dollars for a doorknob. But where are we three? In the barn. My horse will have to move over. So you... Mr. Benny is cursed. If it is a matter of letting go of two dollars, he will never live in his new house. He is just another Benny doomed to tread the path, worn thin through the ages by hundreds of Bennies who have never been able to live in any house they have planned. This is the story of the house that Jack built. The end. Next Wednesday evening, Town Hall Tonight brings you comedy. <laughs> Drama. I can't stand it for hours. You've been kneeling at my feet. Okay, lady, I'll get you another shoe salesman. People you didn't expect to meet. One of the last of the organ grinders. Tune in next week for the lowdown on this monkey business. <laughs> In the joy of living, great days and great days. This is the National Broadcasting Company. And now, of Smile 
Hall's in Town Hall tonight, folks. Fun with our star comedian, Fred Allen. It's Town Hall tonight. <laughs> that crowd cheer Fred Allen as he heads his weekly parade to the old town hall. Fred leading the band with an adding machine, followed by those unwelcome additions to the drama, the mighty Allen Art player. Let's join that happy throng, folks. Everybody's going. Everybody's going. Here they come. The young quintuplets. Aren't the babies on exhibition this evening, Doctor? No, madam. The little tots are busy at their radios. It's town hall tonight. Farmer, what's the idea of putting a radio in your hen house, Clem? Hens can learn plenty about laying eggs from that Allen, Zeb. It's town hall tonight. G-Man. But this is hardly a case for the G-Man, lady. It sure is. Those thieves stole my radio, Mr. Hilburn. It's town hall tonight. Well, here we are before the old town hall, presenting that garrulous goof, gasping gay gargantuan guffle, goggling giggling gags, galvanic glorified guffaws, great next guna guna, Fred Allen in person. Thank you. I was just, <laughs> just taking a digest nap there, Andre. <laughs> Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, there's no word from Hodge White tonight, folks. We've just had a flash that the post office subpoenaed Hodge to get back its pen. So Hodge wasn't able to write out his announcement this week. <laughs> so much for quill kleptomania going on around the country. Yeah. And now for the town hall news. The curtain, Andre. Coming right down. Please. The lights go out. And we bring you the latest news of the week. The Town Hall News sees nothing, feels around for the news. <laughs> New York City, New York. Mr. William F. Carey, sanitation commissioner, is starting to prepare a new set of titles for various ranks in the street cleaning department. The purpose of giving men in different branches of the street cleaning service titles is to add dignity to their positions and augment their morale. Town Hall News questioned several <laughs> prominent citizens to check on public's reaction to titles for men who clean the city streets. Mr. Tam Tiddy Squirm, local politician, says, I say the men who clean our city streets are entitled to as much respect as the men who clean our city treasury. <laughs> if my bill goes through, every street cleaner will have a crest on his cart and a coat of arms. What is the coat of arms, Mr. Squirm? A mess of rubbish rampant on a field of manhole covers. <laughs> oh, how picturesque and thank you. Mrs. Renfrew Van Derge, Park Avenue matron, says... Street cleaners on Park Avenue should wear satin breeches and mess jackets. Mm -hmm. After all, one contacts a swankier debris in the better neighborhoods. You can't tell what you'll pick up on Park Avenue. That's how I got my first husband. He was filthy, but with Luca. <laughs> Doberman Swab, a street cleaner, says... I've been motivating a broom on Broadway for 20 years, and all of a sudden they give me a title. Vice President in Charge of Jetsam. <laughs> First thing you know, they'll have me going over the streets for a vacuum cleaner. Excuse me, bud, some bum just threw a racing form in the gutter. If the standards of the street cleaning department are raised and the men all have their titles, we may soon see the day when street cleaners' work will function on a higher plane. Town Hall News shows what may happen if street cleaning department goes high hat. The scene, a spot near Times Square. A woman is about to throw an orange peel into the street. Hey! Hold it, lady, just a minute. Oh, oh speaking to me, officer? Yeah, what was you just going to do? I was going to throw this orange skin in the gutter. That's a trash felony, lady. Ah, oh, the street cleaner will pick it up in a minute. Yeah, New York street cleaners is only making debris by appointment. <laughs> well, what am I supposed to do, hold this orange skin in my hand? No, lady, step over to the box. I'm getting you some service. Oh. Hello? Department of Sanitation? This is Officer Muldoon, corner of 45th and 6th. 
There's a lady here waiting to throw away a piece of orange peel. The minute the phone message is received at the Department of Sanitation, a call is sent out over the special street cleaning shortwave set. Calling all push cans. <laughs> Calling all push cans. Reported once, 45th and 6th Avenue. Lady waiting to throw away a piece of orange peel. That is all. The call is received by two rubbish contact men who have a radio set in their push cab. A few seconds later, they report ready for action. Well, here they come now, lady. Gee, they're pushing that can like mad. Officer, Officer Muldoon. Muldoon! Yeah, boys? We just got the SOS. I'm Jones, officer, senior assistant contact man in charge of broom. And I'm Gaffney, officer, second vice picker-upper in charge of shovel. Well, glad to know you, boys. Hey, what am I supposed to do with this orange peel? Is this the lady you put in the corn? Oh, yeah, sorrow. I uh, didn't introduce you, boys. This is, uh... uh... Minnie Pius. I'm from Bridgeport. Glad, Glad to know you, Miss Pius. Hiya, fellas. Now, what about my orange peel? Is the second vice president in charge of shovel ready? Stand up by. Is the senior assistant contact man in charge of broom on guard? Stand up by. You can throw it down now, Miss Pius. Here you are, boys. Share it among you. Touche, Jones. Touche, Gav. <laughs> Some service, eh, Miss Pius? Thank you, boys. Thank, Thank you for your business, Miss Pius. Well, we got a scram. We got a one o'clock appointment. There's a new chock full of nuts store opening on 42nd Street. And the mayor's throwing out the first pistachio. <laughs> Say, is it the confetti you boys are cleaning up? No, no lady. It's, it's the, the nuts. nuts. New York City, New York. The New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad opens a new travel information bureau in the Grand Central Station with brief ceremonies. New Bureau will supply information on areas served by New York, New Haven, and Hartford, and also give general travel service. The Town Hall News shows opening of the new Information Bureau. Take it away, Senator. Uh, thank you. I hereby christen you a font of travel information. Well, well I'm... Information Bureau's open, folks. Come and get it. Oh, uh, clerk. Yes, lady? Uh, what time can I get a train for Albany? Do you want to go on the 2-2 train, lady? Never mind the baby talk. i got to get to Albany. <laughs> the train goes 2-2. I know the train goes 2-2 and the automobile goes honk-honk. But what time can I leave for Albany? At two minutes past two, lady. Well, why don't you say so? Of all this stupid... Hey, Bart, uh, give me a ticket and make it snappy. A ticket to where? Any place. I got business all over. <laughs> well, the ticket window's to your left. Oh, a wise guy, eh? Just for that, I'm taking a bus. I never see it. Now, what is it, mister? Hey, I, uh, I got two weeks' vacation. Where can I go? Well, that all depends on how much you want to spend. For $12, you can go to Maine. Twelve dollars? Uh, let me see. Oh, Clark. Yes, lady. Can I go to Syracuse by Buffalo? It's quicker by train, lady. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, uh, you say I can go to Maine for twelve dollars? Yes, sir. Old Orchard Beach, Portland, Booth Bay Harbor. Twelve dollars is a little too much. You can go to New Hampshire for eight dollars. Eight dollars? Oh, uh, Clark. Yes, sir. Can you tell me if I can get a friend at Figglegrass with Dorset and Knit Rob on the state about these? On track seven. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, say, uh, you said eight dollars to New Hampshire, mister? Yes, that's right. Well, eight dollars is a lot of money. You can go to Connecticut for three dollars. Oh, pardon me, clerk. Yes, lady? Is the milk train in from Peekskill yet? Just got in, lady. Good, I want to get two quarts. <laughs> uh, uh, you said three dollars to Connecticut, didn't you, buddy? Are you still here? Yeah, three dollars is a lot of money to go to Connecticut. Well, you can go to Porchester for two dollars. Two dollars, eh? You can go to New Rochelle for a dollar and a half. You can go to Yonkers for a dollar. Uh, where can I go for 85 cents? You can go to... Uh, 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 uh. I'm... I'm a minister. A minister? Yes, where can I go for 85 cents? To the Paramount. <laughs> New York City, New York. A two-day sale of period furniture held at the Park Burnet Galleries on Fifth Avenue brings total proceeds of over $22,000. The highlight of the auction was the purchase of a Napoleonic gold snuff box for $500. Town Hall News shows candid camera shot of the snuff box being auctioned. The scene, the auction galleries. <laughs> Sold to the lady with the toes coming out of the shoes. <laughs> Next, I'm putting up this solid gold Napoleonic snuff box, used by Napoleon himself at Waterloo. What am I offered for Napoleon snuff box, folks? This lid opens up. I just, uh, uh, what am I offered? Gesundheit. Five hundred dollars. Gesundheit. Sold. Gesundheit. <laughs> 
New York City, New York, MGM presents one of the outstanding pictures of the season at a leading Broadway theater. The film, Yellow Jack, is hailed as artistic success by press and public. Town Hall News presents a ten-second preview of this picture, Yellow Jack. Yellow Jack. Why ain't you playing your violin in public these days, Mr. Benny? I'm afraid. Yellow Jack, huh? Thought the monkey had something there for a second or so. <laughs> and now the town... The now... We can probably do more with my head than I'm doing with it. Ladies and gentlemen, at this season of the year... Pardon me, Mr. What? Allen, but may I use the, uh, this microphone for a minute? You see, I'm a school teacher, oh, and I'd like Oh, to... I get it. And you want the microphone to scare your class into turning off the radio and settling down to their homework. <laughs> oh, no, Mr. Allen. I'd just like to remind the parents of school children how important good dental habits are. Well, now, on Sunday morning here at the town hall, the Hay Fever Guild will meet for pollen drill. Let's and there... Alice! Let's now, quiet. Alice! Uh-uh. The acoustics bruise easily here. I may have to dab some minute rub on the walls of these the acoustics sort of... Uh, uh, uh Hello? <laughs> Well, sir, they laughed when I said the magician's hair was coming out. They didn't know I was going to pull his rabbit out of the hat. <laughs> if it isn't... If it isn't... <laughs> well, you have to make faces with a joke like that, just you... A poor old joke like that, you drag it out, you have to help it as much as you can. <laughs> what I really should do is hide that monkey on me and let it out at rare, <laughs> on rare occasion. Well, if it isn't, what's her name? Yes, Mama sent me out to get a golf club. Well, don't tell me your mother's taking up that rollicking game of meadow badminton. <laughs> no, but our baby followed a golf ball. A golf ball, and your mother is... Uh, uh, Mama's going to spank it with a niblick. Well, you'd, uh, you'd better get right home and caddy for your mother. The baby might turn out to be a tough course, you know. <laughs> Hello, Portman. Uh, pardon me, but uh, I never speak to strange men at microphones. Portland, this is Andre Barouche. Andre's taking Harry Von Zell's place, remember? Oh, yes. Hello, Andre. Gosh, you were swell last week. Yes, yes. Well, thank you, Portland. Hello, fans. <laughs> Hello, Peter. Optimist in the plural, yeah. <laughs> not, uh, not stuff Van Steeden. It isn't Benny Goodman. Well, you could be with the top of your head going into that big apple. Be careful. You know what you got from Jack Benny Sunday night. <laughs> and did I laugh when Jack beat Mr. Allen up on his program? <laughs> See, I nearly passed out when Fred started crying. Yeah, <laughs> when I started crying, huh? Dubbed in a, a cry for me. How did Benny beat me up? In effigy. And at that, he had to make me a little boy in his sketch before he could do it. <laughs> yeah. uh, you yeah. can't take it even as a kid. Well, Benny better not start anything with me, or Jell-O's going to have eight delicious flavors. <laughs> what eight, Fred? What? I said, what eight? Well, out to strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, lime, and black and blue. <laughs> shouldn't fight with Jack now. He's pretty weak going on that yeah, diet. always weak. Say, I wonder why Paramount made Jack cut down on his food. Well, he's making the picture for his room and board. And Paramount caught him overdoing the latter. <laughs> why, they tell me a waiter walked into the commissary one day with 15 meatballs and Benny ran pool before the waiter could set down the plate. <laughs> Benny's better in pictures than you are for my money. Oh, yes? Who won the Academy Award last year? Spencer Tracy. And I know Spencer Tracy better than Benny does. <laughs> so what does that prove? It proves that if Benny keeps making pictures, he's going to make fresh air fiends out of a lot of theater goers. You can say what you want, but I thought Jack was swell as Tom Sawyer Sunday. Tom Sawyer. He played the part like one of the Finn boys. Huckleberry? No, Mickey. 
beating me up as a kid. Why, I could have met him in a day nursery and licked him with open safety pins at ten paces. I hope this is someone uh, who knows Benny or a safety pin. Come in. Uh, oh, I'm sir. going fine. No, I'm going fine. And I am saying, lay this fine. Now, fire. wait a minute. Wait a minute. Just a minute. What is this? Has he happened to be looking for a certain party? Uh, Alan is the name. Such a party is on the premises. Uh, this is Mr. Allen, folks. Oh, so I will do the talking. No, go uh-huh. boy. Glove Peters will do the talking. So I am tongue-tied, maybe. I could do the talking. Now, look, look. To settle this, I will do the talking. What is it you folks want? Uh, Harry Wanzell. Such a party is in the vicinity. <laughs> Harry's away on his vacation. Oh, uh, what is Goldberg telling you, Lapidus? So now I'll do the talking. <laughs> Goldberg will do the talking. So who is paying salaries? Lapidus. So who will do the talking? Lapidus. Thank you. <laughs> well, I still don't know. Lapidus what... will explain. But Harry Wanzell is dealing with the deli. Uh, you could use maybe some talent. What is it you do, Mr. Lapidus? You are now looking on Lapidus. And his little Dixie minstrels. Oh, I'm from a Dixie, so he's from Dixie. Oh, the beer from Dixie, too. <laughs> Even if it was on key, I wouldn't like it. Now, don't tell me this is a minstrel show. Why, we'll have you all to know we all is coming direct from down yonder in the sunny south. I am Sugarfoot Lapidus. So honor an Edman on Lapidus's combination, showboat and pawn shop. <laughs> Introducing myself, Lesses Goldberg. Ta-da! You are a minstrel too, Lesses? What else? I'm putting on the face black and making like a darky. How come you all and likewise and stuff like that? <laughs> so no one is presenting me? Are you with the minstrel? I am Honey Bernstein, the darling of the Mississippi. <laughs> Up and down the Mississippi, Honey Bernstein is going like a seagull. <laughs> do you do anything else beside the minstrel show? Sugarfoot Lapidus Little Dixie Minstrels is presenting all sorts of attractions. For example, this season in Natchez, Mississippi, we are opening with Uncle Tomaszewski's cabin. <laughs> uh, between the acts, uh, Honey Bernstein as Little Leva is singing Carry Me Back to Old Virginia with Hot Legs. <laughs> and Sugarfoot Lapidus is playing to Willem, Simon Simon Legree. Where did you play next, Lasses? Next, we all is ringing up in Wigs Butch. Fans is making it Honey Bernstein night. Yes. We are putting on ten nights in a delicatessen. <laughs> Where did you finish your season? At Bass Drum, Arkansas. By a special permission with Gilbert and Solomon, <laughs> we are putting on HMS Pinafore. And the uh, Honey Bernstein is making with a solo. I'm for little butterscotch, for little butterscotch. The reason. Never mind, never mind the reason. We'll skip the reason. <laughs> this is all very entertaining, folks, but what do you want from me? Uh, Lapidus' little Dixie Minstrels is here to go on the radio. Uh, can you give an audition, Mr. Lapidus? What else? The curtain is going up on the opening chorus. Have it, 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 so, how it's feeling by you all, Thimbo? Well, sir, I was sick until I seen my congressman. He is making you all feel better? Sure enough. Now I'm getting a little relief. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so now, Sugarfoot Lapidus is singing. No, he's not. Am I to construe that Lapidus' little Dixie Minstrels is not going on the radio? Over my dead body. So who could wait so long? Come on. So Honey Bernstein is having the last one. No, let's just go by he's having the last no, one. And no. I say Sugarfoot Lapidus is having the last no, one. No, no, you're all wrong. Portland has the last word. Portland? Sally? Hello? <laughs> This morning, ladies and gentlemen, while thumbing my way through a calendar, 
I was brought up with a start to learn that yesterday was the anniversary of the first use of the telegraph. Well, as I often say, times do change. In the old days, when you had an important message to deliver, it took an awful lot of... and a considerable number of... to get your point across. But nowadays, all you need is a microphone and Andre Baruch. And the important message, ladies and gentlemen, concerns you and how Sal Hepatica can help you feel at your best every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the mighty Allen Art Players. This is the only company to ever play Trelawney of the Wells in the Dust Bowl and have the wells dry up on Trelawney during the first act. Tonight, they present a sluggish racetrack mystery called Who Stole the Favorite? Or One Long Pan Had His Hands Tied... Still, he was feeling his oats. Over to your Peter. Mrs. Jitney's residence. Uh, good evening. I'm Professor Spavin. Is Mrs. Jitney expecting you? Yes, I've come to question Mrs. Jitney about her horse, Dog Biscuit. Ah, yes. Dog Biscuit is racing Rear Admiral tomorrow. Oh, Metcalf. Someone for me. Professor Spavin is here to see you. Oh, how do you do? Well, sit down, Professor Spavin. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Jitney. The Equine Neurological Institute wants to psychoanalyze Dog Biscuit before the big race with Rear Admiral tomorrow. Oh, very well. Oh, Metcalf? Yes, ma'am? I'll go out to the stable and convey to Dog Biscuit that he's to be psychoanalyzed. Very good, ma'am. Dog Biscuit's a most unusual horse, Professor. His mentality is amazing. Uh, there's talk about the paddock, Mrs. Jitney. The dog biscuit actually reads. Words of one syllable, yes. Oh. And dog biscuit is crazy about the movies. Has he a favorite movie star? Yes, Dorothy Lemaire. Well, I can't wait to psychoanalyze your horse, Mrs. Jitney. Mrs. Jitney, oh, Mrs. Jitney. He what? disappeared. Who, me, who, Metcalf? Dog Biscuit, Mum. He's disappeared. Well, he's been horse sapped. Uh, what about the big race with Rear Admiral tomorrow? Dog Biscuit has got to be found at once. We must notify the constabulary. Oh, this is awful. Terrible. Calling all cars. Calling all cars. Calling Detective One Long Pan. Racehorse Dog Biscuit stolen on eve of race with Rear Admiral. Report to Mrs. Larry Bay and Jitney. Shake it up, Long Pan. Snoop around the stable. See what's in the wind. Calling one long pan, calling one long pan, reporting one Come in. Greetings, uh, hi-ho, kitty. Detective one along pan on job. Make things hum pronto. Hi-ho, hi-ho. I love a Minsky show. A Minsky show, I always know hi-ho. Who is this person, Metcalf? I say, if you're leaving samples of egg pouillon... Pouillon you, Mr. Flanke. I command you to eject this bounder, Metcalf. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Wet crap inject flounder. Long pan may be poor fish, but not flounder. The camels are coming. We're sure to have soup. The camels are coming. Boop, boop, boop. The camels are coming. Why, this man is an imbecile. A positive nitwit. Just what is your business here, jaundiced one? I am Detective One Along Pan. Chinese fellow pants. You mean you're the detective they sent to find my dog biscuit? Exactly. You lose a dog biscuit already? Yes. Have you any clues? Very simple. Kitty stuff. X-ray dog. Find dog biscuit every time. Hey, soft, so long. Why, where did he go? Of all the lunatics. I ho, cheerio. Are you back again? You bet. A long time forget important business. You mail reward care, YWCA. But the YW is the girls' club, alien. You bet, you bet. A long pan, a part time gigolo. So long. Come back here, you pigtailed moron. You better come back, uh, cutie pie. You, uh, you make a uh, little neck. Honey clam. <laughs> but I say you haven't solved the mystery. Dog Biscuit is the name of my racehorse. Yes, and why don't you start detecting, you Shanghai Babbitt? Uh, Shanghai Babbitt. Yes. Uh, Dog Biscuit has got to race Rear Admiral tomorrow. If my horse defaults, I'll be locked out of Belmont. Very good. A long pass swish into action. First required description, missing horse. Dog Biscuit is a white stallion with black spots very close to his mane. Hog uh, Fliskit, night of scallion, black spats on fair coast vein. <laughs> he has wide legs and big teeth, very yellow. Fried eggs, a pig's a feet, a chair yellow. Maybe fine horse and frigid there. <laughs> oh, 
ridiculous. This is the work of some crooked gambler. You're bad. Maybe Nick the Flake. Important clue. Horse not rambler, victim crooked gambler. Oh, ho, 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 ho. rambler gambler. Long pan China Irving Berlin. Come on along, come on along. Here Confucius, like time band. Come on along, sir. If you're not the silliest. What was that? That was a knock on door. Long pan solve mystery every time. You, uh, you open door, what, what? Maybe important clue. right ho. Yes? What is it? I hear there's been a horse stealer in these parts, lady. Who are you? I'm the Lone Ranger. <laughs> if Dog Biscuit can't race, I can rent you my horse, Silver. If Long Pan fails, I'll do it. Silver rents for $20 an hour. I'll give you 10 20 is the union scale, lady. Has the Lone Ranger a union? You bet. CIO Silver! <laughs> I say the solitary mountain. Quiet, Flunky. Long pond close in. Who last see missing horse, Flog Biscuit? My butler, Metcalf. Yes, I brought Dog Biscuit his supper about an hour ago. Very good. What a horse eat for supper? Maybe clue. Well, for an appetizer, he had an oat pan dowdy. At the miser, goat, can For an entree, carrot Suzette. At the muse. The main course was bran ragu. Dan la glue, danger stan la glue. And for dessert, alfalfa souffle. Oh, alfalfa souffle. Yum, yum, delicious, delicious. No coffee? No, a demi-bucket of barley water. Oh, demi-bucket barley water. Lucky horse. Eat better than one long pan. Why not? Could you win the Santa Anita handicap? Oh, who know, Mrs. Smarty? Long pan never cry. What the dog biscuit do after supper? He listened to the radio for a while. Aha. Horse like radio. Important clue. Yes, before going to bed, dog biscuit always listened to the barn dance and Eddie Cantor cultural programs. Very good. Aha. Knock at door. Very significant. On trade. Aha. Who are you, Mr. Knock on door? Hey, was the Lone Ranger just here? Yes. That's all I want to know. Silver cup bread is the big streamlined loaf. And I want... Hold on, hold on. Who are you, Silver Cup? Oh, I always come after the Lone Ranger. For what? To read the commercial. Silver cup bread is go the away, finest... Go away, go away. Take a walk. You take a walk. <laughs> One long time, waste no time. Slam door. Two now. You've got to do something, Long Pan. You better do something. Long Pan, go to town. Investigate Sheena Klein. Where's your stable? It's right out here. Well, let's go. Oh, my, it's dark out here. I can't see the path to the stable. Long pan detective. Long pan find stable. Take a deep breath. Ah, ah, ah. You turn left, turn left. You catch him. <laughs> oh, yes, here it is. Now open the stable door, Metcalf. Right oh. Uh, wait, I shall switch on the light. Ah, uh, fancy stable. Duplex store, both empty. Who occupies second store? That used to be Queenie's. Queenie? Yes, she was a mare I used to race. I sold her a few weeks ago. Aha! What's she little femme? <laughs> Important clue. When you sell Queenie, a dog, a dog, a dog, a dog, a dog, a bistic, uh, carry torch, uh, maybe? Oh, he was quite upset, quite yes. Upset. <laughs> we showed movies in the stable that night, and he came whinnying at Catherine Hepburn. Very significant. Oh, so, oh, so significant. Long pan examine dog biscuit stall. Oh, very fancy. Oh, high class. Silk line oat bag. Plumium shoe tree for her shoe. Picture on wall. Yes, that's Clem McCarthy. Oh, Clem. From your Clem to, to dog biscuit. Personal autograph. What is empty picture here, flame here? Queenie's picture was in that frame. Good heavens, it's gone. Dog Biscuit have a sweet patootie picture in store? Yes, after Queenie was sold, I had to put her picture there to quiet Dog Biscuit. Very significant. Who leave this newspaper on floor? Oh, that's today's Times. Dog Biscuit insisted upon browsing over his press clippings daily. You see, paper torn. A radio page missing. Is that important, Long Pants? You bet. You bet, Long Pants. A short pants on the Long Pants. <laughs> you got, uh, you got radio installed here? Yes, it's right here. Long pan turn on. Important clue on radio. 
Shut on plug lamp. But what can a radio program have to do with dog biscuits? You keep skirt on, Messy. You listen. This is station PDQ. We now present that popular program, We the People. Thank you, Mr. Sparks. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you the most unusual attraction We the People has ever offered. A broken-hearted lover is here in our studio, sobbing over the picture of his missing sweetheart. You are going to hear this remarkable Romeo sob out a plea for his lost Juliet. And here he is, Dog Biscuit, speaking to his queenie. Well, well, well. <laughs> we the people need. Ah, oh, you see? That is my Dog Biscuit, my Dog you Biscuit. You better, Dog Biscuit. Turn later you off. Right o. Mystery solved. Long pan. Never fail. And Dog Biscuit will race tomorrow? No, no, Dog Biscuit not race tomorrow. Double cross, one long pan. Spoil sketch this week, Dog Biscuit not race. <laughs> dog Biscuit, go long pan tomorrow, go personally. Speak, a Dog Biscuit, spoil sketch. But, Long Pan, how did you know you'd find my horse, Dog Biscuit, on the radio? Very simple, Mr. Jetney. Yes, up say. Yes, up say. Any time horse missing, tune in any sponsor program. Sure to hear plug. Oh, 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 oh. long pan hot tonight. Maybe fire tomorrow, but hot tonight. <laughs> And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, next Wednesday evening, Town Hall Tonight brings you comedy. <laughs> Drama. I'll never marry you, Rudolph. You're leading a double life. Can I help it if I'm a stand-in for Robert Taylor? People you didn't expect to meet. A man who will imitate any dancing star you name and reproduce their dances with his fingers. Don't miss him. And music. <laughs> This is the National Broadcasting Company.